Great, appreciate uh, folks joining. We're gonna be taking sort of a, a different look. We're not gonna be at the happy worlds of world's fairs and uh, expositions and that, and uh, doing something else that uh, is, uh, a, a, to be frank, a real dark moment in American history. And I thought it was timely to do it because it all comes into uh, play for uh, events that took place 80 years ago this week, uh, the bombing of uh, Pearl Harbor and the uh, US government's uh, frankly, horrendous uh, overreaction to it. So um, I will uh, start with uh, some pictures, take a break in the middle for uh, a USA propaganda film, and then uh, uh, go back to the pictures. So let me start with sharing screen. And let's see, where did I hide those pictures? Okay. Uh, okay. We're going to start going back to uh, it's an infamous document called Executive Order 9066. <clears throat> this is a timeline of uh, events that happened in it. <clears throat> Excuse me. December 7th, 1941, the day that will live in infamy, uh, the uh, sneak attack and the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Uh, terrific, uh, horrible time, Har uh, you know, a uh, real mess. And everybody was scared to death that the uh, Japanese were going to come into the United States and invade the United States. If you go and watch the uh, Steven Spielberg movie 1941, it talks about how the hysteria, uh, you know, when a Japanese submarine did some shelling of a refinery near Santa Barbara, uh, convinced everybody that the uh, Japanese were invading uh, LA big time. Um, so all sorts of hysteria. And they decided that uh, you couldn't trust anybody that was Japanese heritage. Didn't matter if they were born here, American citizen, second, third generation, they were Japanese, they were not to be trusted. So on February 19th, 1942, uh, FDR issued Executive Order 9066, which basically said everybody of Japanese descent had to be relocated from sensitive areas which was anywhere on the West Coast and anywhere on the East Coast and taken away. And we're gonna go through some of the, uh, the ramifications of it. So they set up a whole bunch of camps across the United States. You can see a large number of them in California, up and down the states. There's different types on here. Some of these were temporary centers where they took people for uh, you know one, two, three weeks, maybe a couple of months. Others were long-term camps. They were there three, four years. There were prison camps. There were uh, army bases. There were a whole variety of these, uh, these particular camps built across the country. Uh, here is uh, Manzanar, which is going to be the, the focus of the talk today. It's dead center in the map. If you know the LA area at all, you can see Lancaster down below uh, off to the left San Francisco. And Manzanar is, if it's not in the middle of nowhere, it's just 10 miles south of there. It's really, really empty, empty, empty up there. For folks who are not familiar with the area, it's called the Owens Valley. It's infamous if you watch the movie Chinatown. The uh, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power bought up almost every square foot of the area so they could suck the water out of it and send it down to LA and the aqueducts. And that's where you get into the, uh, the intricacies of Chinatown. So uh, a very vast area, very barren area, and uh, frankly, a very inhospitable area. And we'll be looking more at that. Again, a map here, this is a uh, aviation sectional for other fellow pilots who recognize the design. <laughs> the closest towns are the city of Lone Pine down below or up top the city of Independence. Uh, they are basically one street towns, not uh, a lot there. And it's in the middle of nowhere. So the US government got involved with Manzanar back in 1941. This is a, a early photograph of an airport they built. And the idea there was that um, they were getting concerned about the uh, World War II coming. They, the Japanese had been steadily marching across uh, parts of uh, the you know, Asian world, taking over China, uh, you know, parts of that, all sorts of other things. So they started looking into uh, a couple of things. One is, uh, keeping an eye on Japanese citizens in the United States, but second, preparing for the inevitable if they were to attack. So the Manzanar Airport was built as a auxiliary field inland. So that the idea was if the military had a fall back from defending the coast, they could go back to these auxiliary fields and um, have a, a second line of defense. 
They also use them for training new pilots. So this is a shot of uh, the Manzanar field, uh, 1943. These are all Taylor craft, small aircraft that were used for training pilots. Uh, they only had one hangar. You can see it out there. But the airport was built big enough that you could bring heavy bombers like B-24s into the field and, again, use it for a, a def second defense line if you had abandoned the coast. So they were familiar with Manzanar. They uh, started building the Manzanar Airport in early 1941 uh, under an agreement with Inyo County that if they ever stopped using it as an airport for more than a one year, the lease would be up and it would go back to the, uh, the county. Uh, another overhead view, this one, uh, October 1944. Down in the lower left corner is the Manzanar uh, Relocation Center that we'll be examining in depth. The highway that runs between them going up and down here is uh, California State 395, uh, which is a, a very empty road most of the time. This is a pretty good sized airport though that they built out here. It was not built because of Manzanar, but Manzanar, or the camp was partly built because the airport was there because they now had a way to fly supplies, equipment, uh, and uh, uh, personnel into Manzanar Airfield to build the Manzanar Relocation Center. And if the Japanese got out of control at this center, they had the ability to fly large amounts of troops in to, uh, to try to bring them back under. So uh, more views. This one uh, taking uh, place in 1947. You can see the difference here. In 1944, there's all the camp buildings. 1947, most of them are gone. And um, we'll be going again through the history of the camp. So the airfield stayed out there for a number of years. In the 19, uh, late 1949 area or so, they decided we're not gonna use it. They tore down the hangar, put X's across the runways to denote that it's a, a closed airfield. Uh, it's in excellent shape today, particularly the main runway going uh, from uh, you know, uh, lower right to low, uh, lower left or lower right. One guy was commenting on a Facebook post how, yeah, the airport's closed, but every time I fly up that way, I make a uh, landing there just to do it. And Kevin and I visit it, we'll take more of a look at it. So again, middle of nowhere, you can see just in these pictures how barren the, uh, the ground is. Uh, not a lot up there. So we're gonna get into the Manzanar camp. And again, before they built the camp, Lots of problems going on with the uh, reaction to uh, bombing Pearl Harbor. Everybody uh, instantly decided that if you were Japanese, you couldn't be trusted. And again, didn't matter if you were second, third generation, you were Japanese, uh, you were the uh, enemy. Sorry, the dog's going crazy. Let me close the door here. Uh, so people started putting signs up proclaiming that they're Americans. And it's really unfortunate. Some of these people have families that were in the uh, military already. Uh, it didn't matter. Uh, they, they wanted you out of, out of there. So they came up with this order to all persons of Japanese ancestry. You have to get out of uh, town. And uh, it, it really is, it, it's kind of amazing. If we take a look at it, I'll zoom in here a little bit. Um, Everybody has to be out of town and you got to carry uh, the following property with you. Bedding and linens, no mattresses, toilet articles, clothing, knives, forks, spoons, and that, and essential personal effects. Uh, we're going to give you the grand time of two weeks to get your business in uh, order. So it means selling everything you own uh, other than your knives and forks and spoons or putting in storage. And you think about it. I mean, this is this is really, truly, truly horrible. These people have done nothing, nothing wrong whatsoever. And we're going to take everything you own and we're going to throw you in a prison camp. So now you've got to sell your stuff. OK, that's bad enough. If, if we look around your house right now and think that in two weeks from now, you got to be out of that house. You got to sell everything you own other than your cups and spoons and, and your uh, sheets. And think about the fact that everybody in your neighborhood has to do the same thing too. And everybody knows you have to do it. So do you think you have any bargaining power? Do you think you have any ability to get a good price for what you own? Basically, you gotta give it away. You have to throw it away. There's a, a movie called Return to Manzanar. It was a made for TV movie and you can watch the beginning of it on YouTube. And this woman's trying to sell her china set, and this guy is just basically trying to nickel and dime her and you know just steal it from her. 
and she gets so outraged, she smashes it to pieces, uh, you know, uh, rather than give it to them. But these people had to get rid of their houses. They had to get rid of their cars. They had to get rid of their farms. Or, you know, everything they owned, it was really a mess. Down here in number three, they say, oh, it's really nice. If you have a nice box of a piano, we'll store it for you. Um, when they sort it for you, of course, what did the government do? They also charged you rent for it, okay? So now you've got your farm that they say, we'll help you find a tenant for it. Um, okay, now you're in a prison camp. The tenant doesn't pay you for being on the farm. How do you go and sue them and do anything about it? Even if you got any money out of the farm or your business or anything, you still had to pay property taxes on it. So now you're in a prison camp. You're not making much money. You got to pay property tax on all of this stuff. You got to pay the storage on your piano. Most people couldn't pay it, so they lost everything. Everything other than the knives and forks and spoons and cups that they carried with them. So I'm going to jump out of this screen here for a moment. I'm going to go over to a movie that um, is it's kind of amazing when you see what the uh, the government did here with it. So let me stop sharing. And I'll bring up the uh, the movie here. And in the movie, I, I will probably stop and make some uh, comments about it because it's it's really kind of horrific uh, here. So, okay, uh, everybody see the movie? Okay, so let's get started on this. You should be able to hear it too. Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, our west coast became a potential combat zone. Living in that zone were more than 100,000 persons of Japanese ancestry, two-thirds of them American citizens, one-third aliens. We knew that some among them were potentially dangerous, but no one knew what would happen among this concentrated population if Japanese forces should try to invade our shores. Military authorities therefore determined that all of them, citizens and aliens alike, would have to move. This picture tells how the mass migration was accomplished. Neither the Army nor the War Relocation Authority relished the idea of taking men, women, and children from their homes, their shops, and their farms. So the military and civilian agencies alike determined to do the job as a democracy should, with real consideration for the people involved. First attention was... My, my first of my political statements during this real consideration for the people, they've done nothing wrong. No crime, no evidence, no anything, but we're going to take you away from everything you own and we're going to throw you in a prison camp. And this movie is made to, to really soft sell this. When you see some of the pictures later on, they'll be showing of how, you know, the, the people involved, it's truly terrible. They absolutely suspended all rights of the constitution for these people. And just because they might do something and you stop and think about it, that would be like, you know, if Ireland decided to uh, invade the United States, uh, they would have to take me and my brother Kevin and throw us in a prison camp because we might side with the, uh, the Irish. They did a certain amount of this with putting uh, Germans and Italians into camps, mostly ones, though, that had shown that they had strong allies to, uh, you know, the, the uh, Nazi movement, that sort of thing. But this was a mass wholesale grab everybody who's done nothing wrong just on the off chance that you may do something wrong because you look different than most of us. Really shameful. It was given to the problems of sabotage and espionage. Now, here at San Francisco, for example, convoys were being made up within sight of possible Axis agents. There were more Japanese in Los Angeles than in any other area. At nearby San Pedro, houses and hotels, occupied almost exclusively by Japanese, were within a stone's throw of a naval air base, shipyards, oil wells. Japanese fishermen had every opportunity to watch the movement of our ships. 
Japanese farmers were living close to vital aircraft plants. So as a first step, all Japanese were required to move from critical areas such as these. But of course, this limited evacuation was a solution to only part of the problem. The larger problem, the uncertainty of what would happen among these people in case of a Japanese invasion, still remained. That is why the commanding general of the Western Defense Command determined that all Japanese within the coastal area should move inland. Immediately, the army began mapping evacuation areas and for a time encouraged the Japanese to leave voluntarily. The trouble for the voluntary evacuees soon threatened in their new locations. So the program was quickly put on a planned and protected basis. Thereafter, the American citizen Japanese and Japanese aliens made plans in accordance with orders. Notices were posted. All persons of Japanese descent were required to register. They gathered in their own churches and schools, and the Japanese themselves cheerfully handled the enormous paperwork involved in the migration. Again, cheerfully handled the paperwork. We're giving you two weeks to give up everything you own. I'm sure they were just as cheerful as shit. Civilian physicians made preliminary medical examinations. Government agencies helped in a hundred ways. They helped the evacuees find tenants for their farms. They helped businessmen lease, sell, or store their property. Now, this aid was financed by the government, but quick disposal of property often involved financial sacrifice for the evacuees. Now the actual migration got underway. The army provided fleets of vans to transport household belongings and buses to move the people to assembly centers. The evacuees cooperated wholeheartedly. The many loyal among them felt that this was a sacrifice they could make in behalf of America's war effort. In small towns as well as large, up and down the coast, the moving continued. Behind them, they left shops and homes they had occupied for many years. Their fishing fleets were impounded and left under guard. Now they were taken to racetracks and fairgrounds where the army almost overnight had built assembly centers. They lived here, until new pioneer communities could be completed on federally owned lands in the interior. Santa Anita Racetrack, for example, suddenly became a community of about 17,000 persons. The army provided housing and plenty of healthful, nourishing food for all. The residents of the new community set about developing a way of life as nearly normal as possible. They held church services, Protestant, Catholic and Buddhist. They issued their own newspaper, organized nursery schools, and some made camouflage nets for the United States Army. Meanwhile, in Arizona, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, and elsewhere, quarters were being built where they would have an opportunity to work and more space in which to live. When word came that these new homes were ready, the final movement began. each relocation center, evacuees were met by an advanced contingent of Japanese who had arrived some days earlier and who now acted as guides. Naturally, the newcomers looked about with some curiosity. They were in a new area, on land that was raw, untamed, but full of opportunity. Here they would build schools, educate their children, reclaim the desert. Their own physicians took precautions to guard against epidemics. They opened a way they didn't do too well with uh, going against epidemics they ended up with all sorts of problems with typhoid and other odds and ends so uh, again this movie puts everything in the best possible light when you get into the reality of it uh, it was pretty damn bad advanced Americanization classes for college students 
who in turn would instruct other groups. They made a rough beginning of self-government, for while the army would guard the outer limits of each area, community life and security within were largely up to the Japanese themselves. They immediately saw the need for developing civic leaders. At weekly community meetings, citations were given to the bloc leaders who had worked most diligently. Special emphasis was put on the health and care of these American children of Japanese descent. Their parents, most of whom are American citizens, and their grandparents, who are aliens, immediately wanted to go to work. At Manzanar, they built a lath house and began rooting guayuli cuttings. The plants, when mature, will add to our rubber supply. At Parker, they undertook the irrigation of fertile desert lands. Meanwhile, in areas away from the coast and under appropriate safeguards, many were permitted to enter private employment, particularly to work in sugar beet fields where labor was badly needed. Again, it's so nice, they were permitted to work in uh, the fields. This was because the government needed the product and uh, the people needed the money. Everything in the camp they had to pay for. So they, they needed a new pair of pants, they had to pay for it. They needed a, a, even their daily meals they were charged for. So everything they were being charged for, they had to find a way to pay. Does anybody think that they got prevailing wages at any of these sugar beet farms? Now, this brief picture is actually the prologue to a story that is yet to be told. The full story will begin to unfold when the raw lands of the desert turn green, when all adult hands are at productive work on public lands or in private employment. It will be fully told only when circumstances permit the loyal American citizens once again to enjoy the freedom we in this country cherish and when the disloyal, we hope, have left this country for good. In the meantime, we are setting a standard for the rest of the world in the treatment of people who may have loyalties to an enemy nation. We are protecting ourselves without violating the principles of Christian decency. And we won't change this fundamental decency no matter what our enemies do. But of course, we hope most earnestly that our example will influence the Axis powers in their treatment of Americans who fall into their hands. You look at that and you think, weren't those Japanese so lucky that we took uh, such great care of them, huh? It uh, is pretty sad. Let me go back to uh, more pictures here and share screen again. Okay, so we'll move on. So now the, the notice has gone up all and down the East Coast, West Coast, and uh, they moved everybody out. As the movie said, they didn't have camps left to put them. So they put them in places like Santa Anita Racetrack. The racetrack's still there today. But can you imagine all of a sudden, all these people thrown in there? Do you really think Santa Anita had the sanitary facilities to take in thousands of people? But there was absolutely nothing for them to do. Sit around and just sit around and sit around until these camps were being built in the, uh, the desert. People, there wasn't enough room to put them, so people ended up having to sleep in stalls that were stables that a week ago had had a horse in it. You can imagine how sanitary some of these uh, facilities were. So now the camps are ready and people are getting all their stuff on the uh, train. Remember, it was only everything you could carry. Uh, there was no provision whatsoever for uh, having your stuff shipped up there. If you couldn't pick it up and put it on your shoulders, you didn't take it with you. And the kids waiting for it. I look at these, these pictures and really my heart goes out. They did absolutely nothing wrong. Their parents did nothing wrong, but they're gonna be living in a prison camp for the next three to four years of their lives. And it's really hard to look at these pictures and think, how did our government think that this kid here, for example, deserved to go to a prison camp? And, and you'll see the conditions in these camps was less than optimal. So they go out to Manzanar, 
there were a number of these camps around. Uh, Manzanar is the closest one to me up in Northern California. Tule Lake is another one, also in the middle of nowhere. These camps were put in the middle of nowhere because the land was cheap. It was also, if you tried to escape from the camp, where are you going to escape to? There's nothing around. There is nowhere to go. And if you walk down to the nearest town, Lone Pine, you obviously have escaped from the camp because you look different than everybody else in Lone Pine. So there was no sense in even trying to escape. I and mean, it was a, a pretty hopeless situation. So this gives you an idea of what Manzanar looked like. Uh, we've got the airfield, the big X up there that you see. Uh, across the road was the main camp itself, the relocation center. Uh, it was built in a grid uh, area. Uh, you saw in the movie, it talked about block nine, building 15 or whatever. Everything was done in blocks. Uh, the large empty blocks between the brute barracks and that were done as fire breaks. And they did have a number of fires that occurred up there uh, during the time the camp was in operation. Bottom left-hand side of uh, where the uh, military personnel lived, uh, the headquarters building and their barracks off to the left. Uh, but all these buildings in the center here were the barracks, mess hall, and other facilities that the, the Japanese were put into. Again, another picture kind of showing the overall scope of Manzanar. You have the, the grids in the center there. Off to the right-hand side was farms because they tried to make it as self-sufficient as possible. So there was a large chicken farm, a large hog farm, and lots of fields to, to grow produce. And uh, an overhead view, again, the X of the airport helps orient itself. And you can see the barracks down below and the land off to the right was uh, used for farming. So shot of the camp being built uh, went up very quickly. You wonder how, frankly, they got this thing. If the order was signed in, 19, uh, uh, in, in February of uh, 1942, and they were able to move people out here two months later, you have to start wondering how many much pre-planning the government had been doing to, to build these facilities. Uh, lots of pictures of them going up. And these are not substantial buildings. Uh, if you look at them, and we'll see other shots closer up, they're wood frame buildings uh, covered in tar paper. So they didn't have solid walls or shingles or anything. Uh, it, it didn't do much to keep out the cold or the, uh, the heat or the dust. And we'll get into the dust more. About the only thing it did mostly was keep out most of the rain. So this is where the people come to the Manzanar War Relocation Center. The government had first called on concentration camps and then realized that was a very negative connotation because what the Germans are doing with their concentration camps. But this was the main gate into camp. Uh, guard post is there with a car at it. This was the American soldier guard post. Just inside of it was the Japanese guard post because as the film mentions, they uh, came up with a system where the Japanese would basically be in charge of the inner part of the camp, the American uh, soldiers on the outside of the camp. This is the first group arriving in Manzanar. They're walking in on March 21st, 1942. Uh, buildings are far from being done. You can see water lines are still being put in. But this was part of the advanced contingent that was sent up there to get the uh, camp ready for the larger groups that arrived about two weeks later. And again, everything you had, you had to carry it up there. Armed soldiers doing the perimeter. Uh, at first, there was a barbed wire fence put up. Then they put up four guard towers, like you can see the one behind me. They later increased that to eight with spotlights uh, and a no man's land between the Japanese line and the soldier's line. So you have Japanese uh, guards patrolling on the left and soldiers uh, on the right. And this gives you an idea of where home is going to be for the next three years or so. These tar paper shacks, the magnificent beauty of the Alabama hills behind you, but inside the camp, nothing, dirt, empty, you know, just empty dirt in almost every direction because they bulldoze whatever plants and everything were in there. And you'll see in the modern shots today, you don't get a lot growing out there. But this is uh, looking over down the, the view of camp. This is a nice day. Everything's kind of uh, uh, pleasant looking, right? Uh, looks great. The old glory's going. Same shot, uh, but notice the dust. And you cannot underestimate how bad this dust was. Um, it, it's truly, truly terrible. 
To put it in perspective, Carol and I were up in the area about three years ago and uh, a dust storm came up as we were driving uh, down the road. And it was so bad that when we got back to LA, we had to replace the windshield on our, our car. I mean, we were there in the dust storm for about 45 minutes and it ruined the windshield of our car. These people are in this for three years. And if you go to the museum there today, they constantly talk about the dust. It got into every crevice, nook, cranny, everything that you could get into. And again, these were not substantial uh, airtight buildings. They were, they were basically shacks. So the dust was truly, truly horrific. Here's another view of a dust storm sweeping across the area. Uh, maybe not as bad as the Saharan dust storms, but having gone through the one that Carol and I went through, I don't want to go through another. So views of the camp, some kids walking through it. Here you can see what the buildings look like. The fact that they're not shingled roof, it's just tar paper stretched between wood lathes. More views of the, the camp. This was taken from one of the guard towers. You can see there is a little bit of vegetation left over on the right hand side is a baseball field. We'll be taking a quicker uh, look at that. This was the American, uh, uh, I, I keep saying American. A lot of the people in this camp were American. This was the army barracks, much more substantial than the, the Japanese barracks. Real walls, real roofs, uh, 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 much better quarters for the, uh, the soldiers and their families who were out there. This is a view of the camp in uh, winter. Uh, actually, this, this is summer. This is a summer view. The winter's coming up. Uh, as you'll see in one of the pictures, summer in Owens Valley is not pleasant. It can be 110 degrees out there. And uh, as they noted that the, uh, uh, the buildings had no air conditioning, uh, they didn't even have fans. They got very, very hot in summer. It also got very, very cold in winter. And a lot of the people that were in the camp had never been through this sort of thing. If you live in LA, you do not get used to snowy winters. It's just not a thing. A large group of people put in the camps came from areas like Bainbridge Island up in Washington, which they decided was too close to the Bremen and Naval Base, so they needed to come out of there. They came from a very uh, you know, cool, wet climate, and now they were thrown in the Manzanar, it was 110 degrees, and there is no shade. Uh, they, built all sorts of facilities. So you had a Catholic church out here. Uh, the, the government can tell you that they analyzed everything. They could tell you exactly how many pounds of potatoes they used at the uh, facility during the year, how many people were Catholic, uh, Protestant, uh, Buddhist, and other. Uh, here you see people lining up for a dining hall. Again, you had to eat when they told you to eat. You didn't decide, hey, I, I want a snack. I want to go down to the refrigerator and get myself a, you know, a glass of something. No, you had meal times that you were assigned to. The people talk about how they liked to try to get into the second of the two meal shifts because the cooks might give you something extra rather than throw it away. So the government had to step in and say, no, not everybody can eat in the second shift and we'll rotate you between you're in first shift this week, second shift that week. But there were no snacks, no refrigerators, uh, and you had to pay for everything you ate. Uh, you know, they didn't charge you, you know, per item, but you had a daily meal fee that you had to pay. So now you're there with your wife and your three kids, and you've got to find a way to pay for their meals. You're going to have to go to work. And most of the women in camp also had to go to work. And we'll go through more of that in a moment. But you're lining up to go into your, your meals. And not exactly a, a five-star restaurant, wood tables, wood facility, wood everything. And again, keep in mind in summer, this is gonna be 110 degrees or even hotter inside than the outside temperature. They had a co-op store. You could go in and you could buy these, these people making pies. You can see behind them, they had uh, sodas for sale and other odds and ends. Again, a price tag on everything. Um, all sorts of supplies, the government came in. They were uh, very, very good. And they can tell you exactly how many rolls of toilet paper they used in the camp. So uh, they provided certain things like toilet paper and that uh, other stuff. But anything else you wanted, you had to uh, work to, to go get. So some of the people worked in the, uh, the camp stores and facilities. Others worked in the camp offices. And that presented a real conundrum for some of the people because as the movie mentioned, they wanted the Japanese to be, quote, self-governing, unquote. 
Well, the problem was if you worked in one of those positions as a block warden, the Japanese didn't trust, trust you because you were in cahoots, they thought, a lot with the uh, people that had put you in the prison in the first place. So there were all sorts of things about who was a stooly stool pigeon, who was to uh, be loyal and trusted. And it led to, led to a uh, an unfortunate event where some people were killed at. I'll talk more about that when we get to uh, present day Manzanar. But a lot of people worked out in the fields, uh, huge farms as mentioned. Uh, you can see the uh, Alabama Hills behind it. So they were out there growing all sorts of uh, produce. Uh, they generally did not have any, uh, any extras. If they did, they could sell it to the local areas, but the whole idea was the camp to be self-sufficient. Uh, um, so people out working in the fields. This is a, a shot of uh, gourds that they had uh, harvested. They were stacked up in a, a you know, facility waiting for use during the year. They mentioned they had a free uh, press. They did have a Japanese newspaper. Cal State uh, University Northridge has a pretty good collection of these newspapers. Uh, there's some on display at the Manzanar Museum today. And they uh, went through an awful lot what was happening with the Watanabe family and uh, congratulations to so and such who had just passed this test or whatever. Uh, but um, it was not quite the free press that uh, you might think. Uh, if they got too critical of the United States government, uh, they were told to stop. There were very few pictures taken at first of Manzanar because a lot of the people didn't bring their cameras. Again, you, you had to carry just what you had uh, on your back. And there was also no way to get film or to develop it. The government uh, sent in some noted photographers, Ansel Adams and Dorothy uh, Lang to take pictures, but they were very sanitized. Uh, no pictures of barbed wire or guard towers, just people having happy times living in their summer cottages out here. Eventually they decided uh, there was uh, one Japanese photographer who had brought a camera in the government was thinking about taking it away from him, but they allowed him to start documenting life at Manzanar. At first though, they would only let a Caucasian actually snap the shutter. So he could go and point out what he wanted a picture taken of, but they didn't trust him not to take pictures of things they didn't want taken of. So a Caucasian had to take the pictures with his camera. Uh, over time, they relented and uh, let him go around and start documenting the, the life. As I mentioned, people had to go to work. Uh, they ended up with a uh, combination of things here. It was a way of keeping people busy because you know, the idea of an idle mind is the devil's playground. So give people something to do and they don't think so much about their lot. This was a way that the women could work as seamstresses, that they could make clothing for themselves, teach people that didn't know how to sew how to sew. And you know, the, the government would bring in fabrics. Again, you had to buy the fabrics but now you can start making clothes out there. A lot of people also went to work in a large camouflage facility. There was a brief mention of that in the movie, but there were two very large buildings off to the uh, northern side of the site where uh, they built uh, uh, camouflage nets that would go on tanks, uh, 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 installations around the government. So a lot of people worked out there in the, uh, the camouflage area. So again, they put, put a major facility in here for turning out uh, clothing. They're busy working away. A lot of them still continued to work in the fields. Uh, knowing the heat of the buildings, a lot of them preferred to be outside. And a lot of these people were displaced farmers. So they, uh, they were basically doing what they had done all their lives, farming, gave them a semblance of some normality in their life. But they also had a thing, would you like to look for a job? Short-term leave or indefinite leave may be granted to permit you to go most anywhere in search of employment. Well, that meant you could go anywhere if you went to work basically for slave wage, uh, wages. And this is the sort of thing that really pisses me off about the whole man's and our thing. We don't trust you to be in California because you may do something bad, but we're gonna trust you to work at a steel mill in Detroit because we need the manpower. We've taken all the American um, males, we've drafted them and we've sent them off to, uh, to war. So we have all these things we'd like to do. So we'll let you leave during certain periods of time to build what we need to do. And then when that job's up, guess what? You can't stay in Detroit. You gotta come back to Manzanar. So, you know, it was really a, a, a lousy situation. A lot of these people did take jobs and went out because they wanted to send the money back to their families so they could buy some extra stuff at the, the co-op store or others. 
but uh, the, this was not, hey, we're going to just let you go and, uh, you know, uh, it's a leave. It's a short-term leave. We're not releasing you. Oh, you want to join the military? Okay, we'll let you do that. You can, and I'll show you some pictures of that in a moment. You want to go and join the Army? Uh, you want to join the Navy? You want to join the Coast Guard? Sure, we'll let you do that. Um, then they started saying, oh, wow, not only are we going to let you do that, they started talking about drafting people out of Manzanar. So again, okay, I'm the, I'm the man living in Manzanar, and you're going to draft me and put me in the Army. Who the hell is going to take care of my, my family? By the way, they made sure that the people in Manzanar made less money per month, no matter how hard they worked, than the lowest private made in the United States Army because they didn't want a prisoner to make more than the soldiers because that would upset the soldiers. So again, it was a very tightly controlled situation. But this is one of many of the people that signed up, uh, enlisted in the, uh, the Army and served with great distinction. They had uh, the Nisai Division of World War II fought, uh, I think particularly over in uh, uh, Italy, they wanted to make sure that they did not put uh, the Japanese Americans fighting against the Japanese in, in, in the Pacific theater. So a lot of them were uh, served with tremendous distinction and honors. This woman joined uh, the United States Coast Guard and uh, served in, in there. So again, they were perfectly willing. We can't trust you to be anywhere near the port of LA, but we can stick an army uh, rifle in your hand and send you off to storm the beaches at Anzio. These are the ones that are real heartbreakers. School kids, they're outside their school here. And, uh, you know, uh, you can see some snow on the ground and they're wearing mittens and that kind of cold out there. Kid pictures of the kids going across the grounds. And again, done nothing wrong, but you're going to be out here in hell for all these years. School girls on their way home from school, you know, the same sort of thing you might see in any shot of, of a New York uh, or LA or whatever city. In the 1940s, they're wearing their longer skirts. They've got their, you know, sandal shoes on and the haircuts of the day. But rather than walking down Elm Street going home, they're walking down this dirt road to pretty much nowhere. This is one of the barracks that they built. Uh, the barracks, as I mentioned, were uh, tar paper shacks. They got a radiator, a heater in here. And they were divided into units of uh, qu quarters for eight people at a time. So here you are with your wife and two kids, and that makes four of you, right? Well, you're in your quadrant for eight. So they're going to stick four more people who you don't know. And it may be another family of four. It may be four men, four women, four whatever. You, you got stuck in there. They had hung these sheets here as an effort to try to keep some of the dust that blew through the wall to get into the, the building. One of the things they commented out there was that when they built the uh, bathrooms, and when you go into the bathrooms at the visitor center today, they didn't put any stalls between them. So it was just row after row of toilet. So you've grown up your life living in you know, some privacy as you perform your bodily functions. Now you flunk down to a place with a large row of toilets and no privacy whatsoever. So this is kind of interesting. You can see that uh, somebody has bought a small plant in a bucket, put it up on top of the, uh, 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 the, the heater there. But they, uh, they gave them a bunk to live on. And a lot of times when they first moved in, there weren't even chairs. They didn't have that sort of thing. So over time, they worked on these things and tried to make them more hospitable. And this is one of the more um, uh, scrubbed and clean pictures. But the, the Japanese people that were out there were very industrial. All the packing crates that everything came into camp, uh, all the, the supplies, and everything we had seen in that picture of the store, they started making furniture out of them. Uh, they started uh, doing, uh, you know, building bookcases and, uh, and there's some items on display at the museum that uh, were very, very nicely crafted. You could have a radio. And again, if you had a friend that was a nice guy and he was taking care of your house in LA, they let them over time to have your Caucasian friend drive up your radio and drive up your couch if you had not sold it in a panic and you could bring it into your, your barracks. You could only have a receive only radio. They made sure that there were no transmitters or anything involved in it. So over time, these people did their best to try to make a, a, a good situation out of bad. Here you can see the kids corner of a room, lots of their, their decorations. And again, they've made most of this furniture, like the desk was made out of packing crates and other material. And some items, again, were brought up by uh, loyal friends from the outside that were allowed to bring stuff up to at the Manzanar.
So family aside, hard to believe that they posed a tremendous uh, threat to the security in the United States, but that's what they decided back then. This is a, a real interesting one. These are, kids are in an orphanage at Manzanar. They had been in an orphanage in LA. So rather than place them in uh, you know, homes, of uh, Caucasian homes or anything in the, uh, the LA area, no, let's take these kids and move the entire orphanage and stick them in an orphanage in uh, Manzanar. You can imagine pretty little chance that these kids got adopted or taken in by anybody during the time that they, they spent up there. They also built a large hospital, the largest one in Inyo County at the time. This uh, fellow is sitting here. He's uh, very lucky that he's got uh, a radiator heat in the hospital. It was a very well-equipped facility, the largest uh, such one in the area. And after the war, a lot of the material ended up going to local hospitals and, and clinics. This is an Ansel Adams photograph, again, sanitized. They're all up there and they're happy and they're playing baseball. And you'll see a lot of things. Your first thought, my thought was, oh, it's so Americanized. And then I had to remind myself, these people were friggin' Americans. They were doing what Americans do. They played baseball. They did, you know, uh, soccer teams. They did football teams. They did all sorts of things. But they encouraged them to do as much of this stuff as possible, A, to keep physically fit, but again, also to keep your mind off things. So there were different leagues within the, uh, uh, the camp and the Japanese newspaper carried lots of things on this team beating that team and who the winning shortstop was, that sort of thing. Uh, here they're out there having another game. You can see uh, the dust again. It, you cannot go anywhere in Manzanar without kicking up dust. Baton twirling, they had a cheerleader competition. Again, anything you would find in an American high school they had out there. This is kind of interesting one. This is Memorial Day uh, and they're, they're marching a parade. You can see a Boy Scout off to the left. They had Boy Scout and Girl Scout troops out there. There's also members marching here in the American Legion. Some of them had served to great distinction in World War I. They were American citizens. They had been veterans. Didn't matter. You were scooped up. You were dropped in the camp and you got to march as proud American uh, soldiers on uh, Memorial Day. Calisthenic classes were popular, as were concerts. So there's a small stage area built out here. Uh, this was a, a uh, sometimes again, they might bring in people from the outside to entertain. For the most part, anything within the Japanese perimeter was strictly a Japanese affair. So it's a Japanese orchestra playing out here. Volleyball being popular. And kids just doing what they do. They, they could find something and have great fun tearing into it and, you know, uh, catching things up in the mountains. One of the things, you get the hills behind you, and uh, they started talking about how the uh, people would sneak out of camp to go fishing, tremendous trout fishing up in the Alabama hills further up. And uh, they could go out for days on end and uh, because the, uh, the military wasn't coming by and doing nightly head counts because where was there to go to? And there was uh, somebody, uh, the museum talks about how they uh, snuck out of camp and they were caught coming back and they were terrified that the guards were gonna do something terrible to them. And the guard said, hey, here's a fishing line and a hook uh, because they were just using bent pins for it. And they realized that a lot of the guards were not any happier about being in Manzanar than they were. So it was nice to see some, some humanity. But this is still the rea harsh reality of it. Guard tower out there. As the years went on, the guard towers were abandoned. Uh, they didn't feel that there was any need to uh, keep the uh, people up there because nobody was escaping. And if they did go up to the hills to go fishing or hunting, they did come back. They did leave the lights on every night though to give the people of the area the illusion that they were uh, keeping things under control. There was a little bit of beauty in Manzanar, uh, a lot of the rock gardens. This one was built right next to the building. There was a man whose name escapes me at the moment, was a particularly good rock worker. He uh, actually built, uh, again, wood was a real premium. You do, just do not have a lot of trees growing in the Manzanar area, but he got very good in making uh, fake logs out of concrete and making them look like wood. We'll see some of examples of that. But they built these little Zen gardens and uh, uh, flower gardens and that as a, a little uh, slice of uh, color in that. 
This was called, uh, I think it was the Par Pro Paradise Garden or Promise Garden, we'll see more of it. But the, the larger one, uh, bridge going across it, we'll see what this looks like today. And again, a lot of the people, this was their job. They got paid by the government to move the rocks and build it. Uh, and uh, they, they did a really nice uh, job on it. This is kind of an example of uh, one of the rock gardens right outside the camp. Uh, again, water diverted from the aqueduct. The California aqueduct helped feed the camp. Uh, Kevin and I took a visit to the old reservoir system. We'll be seeing that. But uh, so this was the, the beauty of Manzanar, if there was any beauty during the time they were there. Well, this is what the same area looked like uh, years later. Uh, the, all that sand and dust that blows around filled in all the, the uh, rock work. There was just some of it sitting there. Luckily, uh, they came back in the 1990s and did a uh, excavation of it. Some of the families of the people who originally built this uh, came back and, and uh, redid it. And you'll see what they look like today. Uh, we'll get into, again, here's the garden. They had a gazebo out there uh, where people who could do different uh, uh, rites. Uh, people did get married at uh, Manzanari. You could come out here and get married. People also did die. We'll visit the cemetery in a moment. Now we get to the time of uh, these folks are being told you can leave Manzanar. Matter of fact, pretty soon they got to the time being told you must leave Manzanar because now the uh, the war is coming to an end and they said, oh, okay, we can trust you all. And a lot of people left on the first bus out of town to get the hell out of Dodge. But other people said, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? You took away everything I own. You know, I, I have no place to go to. So finally, the military who forced them into Manzanar had to turn around and force them back out of Manzanar. I said, if you're here after this date, no more food, no more meals. We're turning off the electricity. We're turning off the water. You need to get out of, out of town. So these people were leaving. They were happy to get out. And unfortunately, when a lot of them got home, this is what they came home to. People did not want them in their neighborhood. Uh, they were blaming them for the loss of their children that had been killed at Okinawa or Iwo Jima or at that, you know, countless other places during the war. A, uh, a sad, sad situation for, for these folks indeed. So uh, let me jump to some newer pictures and talk more about Manzanar. Just one second here. So after Manzanar closed, uh, it was uh, basically dismantled. Um, the buildings were, some of the buildings were left there for a period of time. So soldiers returning from war had a place to live. They were rented out as apartments. But in the 1950s, uh, it was all torn down. The buildings were sold surplus. You can go out there and see a sale catalog, how each building had X square feet of um, uh, wood available. And each building had six electrical outlets. So a lot of these buildings were all torn down and Manzanar was left as a giant empty field. Then in the 1980s, people became aware of uh, what had happened out here. It was an, something frankly not discussed. People didn't want to talk about their time out there, but uh, people started going back and making pilgrimages out there in the 1980s. And the National Park Service was uh, decided to take over the facility. And this is a map of what you'll see if you go out to uh, Manzanar today. So you have uh, down below old US 395 two lane road, which goes right by the property. And now the more modern US uh, 395, which is a four lane road going by. Uh, we're gonna take a look through here. If you see the uh, bottom left century post entry sign will come in there. And again, uh, this is in the brochure that if you go out there today, they give you two at the drive around the facility. So we'll start with going across the street. This is the old airport. Uh, again, it, there's no sign for it. You just drive down the road, you'd ride, ride right by it. Uh, but it's still out there today. It's a very large, empty facility, 80 years old. And I've flown into some runways that were built much newer than 80 years. Uh, and this thing is an amazing shape for it. Uh, very tempting to take your car down and just race it from one of the, to the other. And no surprise, that's what the locals like to do. Uh, people go out there and uh, do drag racing on it. Uh, it was leased for a while to a company that did some drone work and that sort of thing. It's been used for shooting a number of commercials, but it's got a tremendous backdrop. This is the uh, um, uh, Alabama Hills, still snow up in the, the mountains and uh, it gets really scenic in, in winter. 
These were all taken a week ago today, just about uh, this time too. Hmm. This is looking from the airfield across uh, over to Manzanar. The guard tower is a recreation, as is the barracks building built behind it. But I thought this was a kind of interesting shot. If you can see how barren the land is behind the camp. And again, where are you going to go? You escape? It's not, not many places to go hide. So we'll flop around the airport, kind of emptiness, just enjoying the scenic beauty. And we're going to head over to uh, Manzanar itself. So again, Guard Tower was built about 20 years ago as a, a memorial. There were eight of these. They put it back on the original concrete blocks. One thing as you go through Manzanar, you'll see um, concrete blocks all over the ground uh, with all the footings for the, the barracks up, up there. And now the, here you have the Blue Star Memorial Highway, a tribute to the armed forces that defended the United States of America. This is the old uh, frontage road on the left. You can see the more modern 395 off on the right. And down below, this signs in honor of the Americans of Japanese ancestry who served in the uh, military during World War II. So if we're going to go inside uh, Manzanar War Relocation Center. They recreated the original sign. And here's the guard booth that you pull up to. And this is, again, original structure left from the war. This is where the US military would stop and down below the smaller one where the Japanese controlled their facilities uh, inside for the inner compound. So we remember we have to go no more than 20 miles an hour. They may take away our pass. He's telling us we can go on in. And we're gonna drive over and visit the uh, museum that's uh, over here. Uh, this is the former gymnasium building that was built for uh, the, the camp. They did a lot of shows and performances in there. It's the only major structure to survive intact from Manzanar from the war. And that's because they used it for Inyo County's uh, highway department for a number of years before it was given back to the parks department to turn into a museum. But the very first thing you come to is where the military police were and where uh, the free press was. And there's uh, uh, displays. They have some very good displays all throughout the facility. And this talks about a riot that occurred in the night of December 6, 1942. So these people are in camp less than a year. Again, remember, most of them moved out there in March. And it's coming up to the anniversary of Pearl Harbor. So tensions are really high between the soldiers these citizens and the citizens are not at all happy the way that they're being uh, treated. There had been a uh, beating of a Japanese uh, uh, citizen inside the camp and they blamed another Japanese guy for it. And the whole issue here was whether or not they were being um, loyal to the Japanese community or loyal to the uh, US government. Uh, so lots of uh, tension as far as, uh, again, I mentioned earlier, stool pigeons or infiltrators or whatever. So uh, they, they went and beat a guy for it. Whether he did it or not didn't matter. He got arrested. And now the Japanese were determined that the uh, American military was not going to hold this guy, that they were going to take care of it on their own. So let's start marching on the, uh, uh, the jail and get this guy out of here. And this is where it all occurred. That's where if you look at these empty lots and these concrete slabs, you know, they're, they're silent sentinels, I guess you'd say, of, uh, you know, amazing events that took place. So again, we're coming up on, uh, you know, 79 years from this riot, you're standing out here in this empty field. You cannot imagine the tensions and the turmoil that these people were going through. So they've done a very nice thing displaying it. I won't go through the whole thing here, but basically uh, the, the Japanese were massing they brought in the American military to uh, uh, you know, uh, take care of it. And, and they were really outnumbered. You had 100 American MPs. There were, at this point, about 10,000 Japanese citizens uh, living in this camp. It got up to 11,000 at the highest. So you got 10,000 people upset, 100 soldiers that are supposed to defend this place. Well, the 100 soldiers were armed, the Japanese were not. They got too close and shots rang out and the number of people were shot. Unfortunately, a number of people uh, died. Happily, this was the worst of the things that happened at Manzanar as, as far as use of force. Uh, it was a, a you know, real bad situation. And uh, again, you go out there at the display, tells you about the whole thing. 
This is where the free press was. These trees, some of them survived, some of them are new since the war. And again, it goes all throughout. Uh, this is where the press building was, another uh, view of it, talking about how the whole thing was done. And they preserved some of the maps and accounts. They did quite a uh, uh, investigation trying to figure out if the uh, military had overreacted or not. At the time, they, of course, figured out that they had not. In retrospect today, I don't know what they might have decided. This is the administration area. This is where the soldiers lived. Uh, again, this area was full of much more substantial barracks. These were all sold surplus, moved around, and you can still find some of them standing today out on farms and at, in the area. The only thing that survived out here was stonework. The yucca tree growing in the middle there. And they talk about how this was a community apart. They had more than 400 people working out here because you had teachers uh, that were brought out, uh, you had nurses that were brought out, all sorts of different people that were brought out to work out here. So uh, as I mentioned here, the WRA structures built to higher standards than the barracks lived in, and they were used for uh, World War II, uh, post-World War II housing. Just some of the vegetation that's growing up out there. But a lot of cases, it's hard to tell where the buildings were, except here's the front steps going into the barracks and the concrete uh, footings where they were. Rows of the buildings, you can mark where the toilets were in some of them because you can see holes in the ground where the uh, plumbing came up. And again, just one big empty area. And this is again, just when you get there, a sign that they tell you about visiting the site. Uh, please don't pick up anything. There's still little bits of rocks and shells and you know glasses and stuff out there in the middle of the dirt and they want to leave it as intact as possible. This was a monument put up before it became a national site. This was uh, put up by the, the state of California. And you have the, the National Historic Site Visitor Center. And again, this was the old gymnasium, the only permanent structure still on site. And they explained that this was where they did their ballroom dancing. They showed movies very frequently. They had amateur plays, that sort of thing. And inside a whole bunch of displays, they had uh, this, uh, we're gonna be talking about, and we're gonna go and visit the, uh, the cemetery out there. A model of the camp, uh, there's the uh, building we're in over here on the left, the, uh, the, the gymnasium building. Again, faithful reproductions of each and every one of the barracks, the large fire breaks in between. And here they talk about the folks in Bainbridge Island. So again, you come from a, uh, a very wet, very uh, uh, you know, green area and you're picked up and you're stuck in Manzanar. 227 Man Bainbridge Islanders got there under military escort. This place is so hot at day and so cold at night, so different from dear old Bainbridge. And again, maps of where the camps were. I think there were 11 major camps scattered across the United States. These, again, they had built all sorts of smaller ones, racetracks and fairgrounds and everything. But these are the 11 ones for long-term uh, uh, time that they were stuck in. They also, over in Hawaii, did the same thing to everybody. You can see the crowd down there. Just flip through some of these. And starting over, you had to bring everything in on your back. And down below here, we're gonna start selling everything off at the ends of Manzanar. So you can come out here and build, buy your own barracks. We've uh, taken them apart, we've stacked them up in a crate and you can take them back and reassemble them where you go. Very large display at the back end of the museum. This is the name of everybody who had been uh, incarcerated at Manzanar during the time there. The print is very, very small. Again, you had 11,000 people at a time. There's a lot of names on, on this list. More pictures from the museum, city of barracks. Picture of a kid that did it. Uh, here's where they lived you know, before the war. Uh, this is where I'm living during the war and I have no idea where I'm going after. I mean, a real, real heartbreaker. Again, this was done by about, a, I think it was a seven, eight year old kid. Mention some of the gardens. Uh, again, great displays. Uh, to quote here in bold, it just gave you a good feeling, even though we were confined, people cared about themselves and about their surroundings. So they could go out and work in the gardens, you, know, you could toil in the fields, but you could also try to make something of the life out there. 
They had the school, mentioned school plays, baton, the twirlers, everybody going through it. Jobs, mentioned that again. They recreated this area. You can go out there. They still have, uh, they put up two basketball hoops out there. And when we went out there, Kevin and I were there, there was a kid shooting a basketball out in the, in the middle of the field there. And these are, the rec as a matter of fact, that's the white structure of the basketball hoop just to the right. So these are recreated buildings uh, out here. They rebuilt two of the barracks and one of the uh, mess halls out there. And this is, again, where you go in. This is pretty much what you got into. You had uh, bunk beds. When they first went out there, the mattresses were made of straw sacks. So you might have left your nice, comfortable bed at home, and now you get to go and sleep on a straw-filled pallet out there. If you were lucky, you got a chair. But uh, this is basically what you got, an army cot, a straw a mattress, and uh, nothing to do. This is kind of interesting here. Temperature readings inside the barracks on July 1st, 1942. They started at 75 degrees, got up to 106 degrees uh, at two in the afternoon, and uh, outside, 10 degrees hotter still. Again, you know, no shade. This was an interesting display. When you go into the museum, you can take a tag, which was the same uh, reproduction of a tag that they gave you when they transmitted you to camp. It had your name on it, your barracks assignment. And that, a copy of that tag also went on your suitcase uh, in case uh, it got separated from you. But you can go out and push the button here and these uh, people have their memories uh, that you can hear and uh, listen to them. Over time, they've mentioned housing improvements full speed ahead. They started going and putting walls inside the sheds to try to keep some of the dust and everything out, putting up bar bar uh, barriers between you and the next family of eight. School building where the kids spent their, their time. Fire station, uh, again, a recreation. We'll take a look at that in a, uh, on the way out of camp. Guard tower, recreation off to the side. Before the camp, there had been a town there. Manzanar was a, 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 a farming town. Again, the, the ground is considered fertile. If you get water, water being a real issue, but then they started putting the aqueduct in, so uh, they were able to grow things out there. We'll see what's left of the town of Manzanar. Absolutely nothing. This dirt road going off into the fields, this was the town of Manzanar before the camp was built. Uh, there's nothing out there. We're gonna be visiting one farm in a moment uh, that was out there. But they, uh, they have a dirt road, parts of it paved, uh, most of it dirt that you can drive around the camp. But this is Manzanar today. Not much sign that uh, anything was out there. Again, some of the roads just dead end. If you went straight on this, you would go, be going through the farming area and ending up at US 395. This was a ranch that uh, was out there before the farm, uh, before the prison camp was built. And you can take a, a walk through there. It's fall, so the trees are starting to turn color. Got, again, nice view of the mountains behind it. And this was a view, he had the biggest uh, ranch out there, uh, not uh, just one, but two fireplaces, one for the kitchen, one for heating the, uh, the camp. And that's all that's left of his ranch today. You know, everything is uh, very uh, transient in life. And again, more views of the, the ranch. And now we're going to go and visit some of the, uh, the re, uh, recovered areas of camp. So this is one of the fish ponds built at camp. Again, these had all filled up totally with dirt. Uh, the, the wind and dirt and everything got blown in. The National Park Service came in when they took over uh, uh, control of the property, did a very thorough survey out there and mapped where these things were. But it then took volunteer labor, again, by many of the citizen uh, families that had built this in the first place to come and dig all the dirt back out. There's no water in them today, uh, which is uh, unfortunate. The whole water supply to this area was, was uh, severed. Uh, but uh, it does give you an idea of the intricate rock work and everything that they, they went through in, in doing this. There's some nice benches you can sit for a moment of uh, quiet reflection if you want to, uh, to think about what occurred out here. This is one of the ponds and we'll go and visit some of the, the others out there. 
And again, this is the grounds around here. Uh, during the, the time of the camp, this was a fire break. Uh, there's some structures that were pieces left of some of the buildings, a uh, more distant view of the pond, but this was uh, an area for people just to go and sit and relax. Again, emptiness, desolation, concrete slab after concrete slab. Remember, most of the buildings were built up on uh, little footings on little tiny concrete uh, uh, footings. These other buildings were the more major ones that were built out there. They had to uh, take a load. So warehouses that had to have heavy things like all those gourds we sort of stacked up. Uh, concrete slabs are still out there for the camouflage plant, a few other things. This was the garden area I uh, mentioned before about a bridge that we saw in one of the pictures. They recreated it. You can go uh, over the bridge. Again, it would have been very interesting if they had put the uh, uh, water back in. The gazebo mentioned earlier, that's where that large wood block simulated an old drum is up there in the, the back. And these fellows, again, built this both as a job and also as a labor of love. They've been stonemasons in their prior jobs, and this gave them a chance to uh, continue their, their work out there. A lot of the rock work had special meaning. Uh, here, they left a gap for a, a step. You can go from the one rock across to the other. The uh, signage goes and talks about how they, they viewed that as a, a spiritual bridge. There's also, in one of the pictures coming up, a, uh, they built a rock turtle uh, as a sample of uh, eternal life. So this was called a Pleasure Park a monument they put up in 1943, where the gazebo stood. Here's the turtle that they built out in the middle of the pond. And again, everything was done in blocks. You were assigned to a block number, building number. And this block 34, they allowed them to build a garden. And again, allowed is the word. Everything that they did had to have approval of the uh, you know, occupying forces out there. So their garden is off to the left, uh, large walkway going out there. And footings of the barracks, that's where they all lived right next to this. And here's this garden it was built right up next to the barracks. Picture of it back then, people attending it. They mentioned here, this pond was buried by sand and sediment for 50 years until the National Park archeologists unearthed it in 1999. They later excavated a mess hall root cell. We're gonna visit that in a moment. Reconstructed the historic fence. Uh, the, some of the stones that come loose, they uh, reattached them and they uh, extended the sidewalk that went out there. There's the root cellar for the, the mess hall. Looking down into it again, for folks not familiar with the root cellar, it's a way to store your veggies and that and keep them for the uh, other time of year after harvesting. But this is where you came to for your meals three times a day, waited online, got your name checked off on a list. Because remember, if you didn't pay for it, your name wasn't on the list. I really have no idea what happened if you didn't uh, have the money to pay for a meal. I, I, I don't know what, what they did to you, if they let you write an IOU or if they fed you anyway, but uh, that was the whole situation. Waterfall came cascading down out of this rock garden. This is the reservoir, uh, kind of off the beaten path. I was very glad I had rented a uh, car. After driving uh, Carol's car and get, needing a new windshield, I was not going to take one of the Cotter cars up to Manzanar this time. So uh, we drove way, way out into, it's, it's several miles off the uh, main part of property, but the uh, water would come down from the uh, hills in uh, the aqueduct and go into the reservoir. And again, we have to keep in mind, this thing was built 80 years ago. They built it to, uh, to last, a uh, very large base. And this is the largest tank out there. Upstream uh, were smaller holding basins, uh, chlorinator tanks, uh, all sorts of things uh, out there. People were given a chance, did you want to come out here and work in the reservoir? And a lot of them jumped at it uh, because there were fish that came down in the water. And if you were taking care of the reservoir, you got to uh, you know, uh, do the rock work around it. <clears throat> but you also, <clears throat> excuse me, got to spend time fishing and out there. <clears throat> This is some of the rock work that was out 
built back in 1941-42 by the Japanese, and you can find inscriptions in the concrete that's out there. And here, picture the uh, the whole facility and how the water came down and where it went. This is one of the smaller areas. This is where uh, the water would come in and get chlorinated. Some of the writing that were out there, and what's really interesting is uh, some of the the folks out there were. Uh, as you can imagine, pretty pissed by being out there. Uh, some of the writing that they uncovered was, you know, to the glory of the emperor. Uh, I, I can't wait until we defeat Great Britain and the United States. Uh, you know, there were some malcontents out there, but you have to wonder how much they were malcontented before they got put out there. You know, I mean, if I was picked up, if I was a happy American Japanese living in San Pedro or something, and all of a sudden I got stuck in Manzanar for the next three or four years, I might be pretty pissed with the Jap the American government as well. So uh, very interesting set of uh, you know sentiments that they found out there. Again, this is where the aqueduct, the California aqueduct, got diverted to go and feed into the uh, reservoir system. Here's my brother uh, making our way through this uh, area out there. And again, you can see just desolation everywhere. So people like to go up into the mountains, go fishing, hiking. Uh, one fellow unfortunately had the situation, got caught in a snowstorm, died up there. They later found his uh, body, uh, buried it up there, and uh, you know, uh, never brought him back to the camp to the cemetery. This is where the uh, chlorinator was out there. Oh, I'm not supposed to show this picture to Enterprise Rental Car. Got to remember that. Cemetery built during the time of uh, the, the Japanese uh, inhabitation of it, uh, monument built out there, and uh, several people graves out there. It also serves as a pet cemetery because some people did have pets and they did uh, die out there. Very lonely. Uh, is the, this is the, the far end of camp uh, at the end of the National Park Service area. But uh, a lot of people go out there and they leave memorials. These colored areas out there are origami figures that are left for their family. Unfortunately, people being people being buttheads, you can see people went out and took some shots at the monument. You can see some bullet marks in the side and some more in the, at the back. Some of the monuments and the family tributes that are left out there. There is a mil, uh, pilgrimage that goes out to Manzanar, I believe it's each August. And uh, people go out and, and, you know, you're free, of course, to go out anytime if you have family members or whatever, but it's more of a time of uh, gatherings and performances and speeches and that sort of thing. But this is uh, the people that never left Manzanar. And again, the other side of the monument. Some of the graves of the people that are still out there today. Marker on the Park Service. And again, they talk about the pilgrimage as they started in the 70s. Uh, you know, a lot of people had no desire to go back to uh, Manzanar. Uh, you know, some families said that they didn't even know their grandparents had been out there because they never ever spoke of it. Uh, and then a number of people, particularly one woman, started leading a, a thing about, hey, let's not kick this under the table. You can see her mention up there on the left. Let's make sure that this thing is brought to the forefront. Because you got to learn from history, you got to learn from doing, and we don't want to ever do a Manzanar again. So, continue to see another one of the fish ponds, gardens. Very lonely, very quiet place. Here's some of the concrete work done by the artist who I mentioned became very good at making uh, wood out of concrete so that they felt that they had some sense of connection with uh, nature rather than a connection with concrete. So he got really good at putting knot holes and stuff in there. And all around the site, you just find stuff like this, pieces of buildings, pieces of where people used to live and play, and just uh, little bits of memories. And again, the Park Service asks you to just all leave it in place and don't take it. Concrete slabs out in the middle of nowhere. There's the recreated buildings and the basketball hoops in the background. And we end up Manzanar Fire Department. They, uh, they had a, uh, a fire truck that had been sold worth uh, World War II surplus. 
um, used by local fire department. Uh, they decided to get rid of it. National Park Service decided to uh, uh, get it. And this is a original fire truck that was used at Manzanar. And I think they had, I think it was, they said 92 different fires they had to fight during the time they were out there. Because like everything else, you have cooking fires, electrical fires. You can imagine this place was very ramshackle, uh, thrown together in a moment of notice. And uh, they, they had, I think, only maybe about four buildings burned down during the period of time. But they were able to uh, you know, serve. That was their job. That They came out there, sat there like most firemen do all day doing nothing. But when you do need them, you need them big time. And uh, these, these fellows came out and did, the, did their job. So the fire station's a recreation. It's right on the original site, being built to photographs of the original station. Uh, again, some pictures of them fighting a blaze down below. And it was very important that they had this fire department and that they did keep it staffed 24 hours a day because these buildings were tinder traps. I mean, tar paper and wood sitting out in 110 degree sun, you can imagine no moisture in the wood. If uh, anything got heated, it went up in flames. And again, all sorts of things people wrote into the, the, uh, the ground and they've uh, gone off and uh, you know, recorded those. So we've left Manzanar and we're gonna go to the Alabama Hills, take a quick drive through there. If you're a Western movie buff, you gotta go to Lone Pine. Uh, my brother had not seen any Gene Autry movies. I think I've watched them all and I mentioned it to him. I didn't get a chance to uh, make him sit through any of them, but uh, you know, you don't not think you're in, in California. Uh, I mean, this just looks in the middle of nowhere. How they got the name Alabama Hills, I got to look that up someday. But all this rock work, it's, it's really just spectacular. And it's used for all sorts of science fiction movies. If you're up on some weird ass planet, you know, you can go out there and do this. Uh, this was a rock we particularly got a kick out of uh, as we drove by sitting in, uh, as you go onto this road. If you go onto the road, by the way, it's called Movie Lane Road, and uh, it goes off into absolutely nowhere. Kevin and I were talking about people that get a GPS and follow the GPS and then drive into a river in that. Well, we were get, trying to find, go to the end of Movie Lane Road and turned out it drove into the California aqueduct and it had been washed out and the bridge was gone. So we had to come back and make a very interesting backtrack. So uh, again, on a road, you. You do not want to take your own personal car if it's a, a low profile vehicle as you go through there. But all sorts of opportunities to uh, uh, park there, do things during the day. And a lot of people, I think we'll see some pictures of some of the campers. You can get a permit and camp up there at night. And uh, you can bring your RV up, park up there, and you can imagine looking at this uh, sky. No clouds, uh, the views of the stars and everything up there at night uh, got to be just absolutely spectacular. Uh, there is a museum in uh, Lone Pine, Carol and I went to on a prior visit. If you're into Westerns, they will go and tell you how they shot so many things up there. Uh, movies like Gunga Din, this took the place of uh, the Khyber Pass during that point of time. Recent movies, Django Unchained, uh, all sorts of things are shot up in the Lone Pine uh, area. Uh, if you're a Western buff, you really got to go up to Lone Pine. Here's a tiny little cave in there. If you're a Western buff, you got to go up to Lone Pine. The museum is really, really nice. It's uh, pretty uh, reasonably priced. And uh, they do a big uh, event up in Lone Pine every year, setting up an outdoor theater, screening a bunch of the, uh, the movies, having the decreasingly fewer and fewer number of people that uh, worked on them, cinematographers, not just the actors, but the, the film crews that came up here and uh, worked in the area. It's a, uh, it's, it's really, uh, if you're a Western buff, it's, it's a great spot to go to. Lone Pine's a kind of cute little town, not a lot to do up there, but uh, further north of there, you get up to Independence. There's some beautiful areas up in these mountains, uh, uh, Convict Lake, uh, other areas. So if you're like most people in LA and you never get up to the, uh, the Sierras, this is a, a, a tremendous spot to, to go and, and visit. So that's the, uh, the look at both the inhumanity of, uh, of Manzanar and the, uh, uh, what you call the beauty of, of, of the area. So I'll take a look at the chats for a moment, but uh, people who like to uh, weigh in or anything, feel free. You should be uh, able to uh, unmute yourself and just start speaking. 
Okay, I'll just... Yeah, hey, Joey. Hi, I Bill. I think this is actually the most fascinating show you've ever done. Oh, you know, it's the heartfelt uh, one to me. I, I, I had heard about Manzanar and your first thought was, OK, you know, we got to protect America and we got to put these people someplace. Well, that might have been an OK thing. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But putting them up there, this was a shithole. I mean, it really was. There's no way to, to sanitize it. It's just a terrible. I mean, you wouldn't put prisoners of war in a place like this. And we put American yeah. citizens up there. So Carol and I had been going up. Uh, we took a, a road trip a number of years ago, and uh, we went up to uh, I mentioned Perry, places like Convict Lake and that beautiful area up there. But we got to Manzanar very, very late in the day, and we took a, we went to the museum, and they saw like you know you got 45 minutes to get in, and get out. And yeah, I mean they're really nice, but they got to go home like everybody else. And uh, so the barracks and everything were closed when we got out, and we drove through the, the camp as sunset was coming down. And it really had an impact on me, uh, you know, thinking about it. And, uh, you know, it's just a terrible, terrible time. It, uh, it, it's, it's really just, there's no other way to put it. It's inexcusable. When was the first movie made and how was it distributed and shown? It was made mid-19, mid-war. It was made about 43 or so. And it was shown in theaters as a, a, a way of, again, uh, propagandizing. You may have noticed that all your Japanese neighbors are gone, uh, but we're taking really good care of them. We sent them to a summer camp. Uh, it was uh, uh, a, a real propaganda piece. Yeah, Roger. Hi, go ahead. I haven't joined for a long time, but your topic today obviously is very close to me being of mm -hmm. Japanese ancestry. And Having my grandparents and my mother and all my a lot of my Japanese American friends, their parents and grandparents, et cetera, great grandparents being interned. So um, I, I wanted to join and, and, and just hear what you're going to present. And um, I have to say, give you compliments. You did an excellent job in, in explaining the story, um, what happened to you know all these people during the war. And um, there, there, of course, is as you're going through it, I have hundreds of other side stories and side things. So for every little comment you made, there's a lot of other details and interesting facts, good and bad and things that go along with it. But you did an excellent job in doing that and um, just bringing awareness to a new group of people. I don't know how many people have heard about this in such detail before, but I wanted to thank you for, for bringing this topic up. You're like the pebble that gets thrown into the pond and the waves start. We need to have this awareness spread um, we need to learn from this tragedy in American history. So um, just being one of those pebbles to start the start the conversation and getting the awareness out there. I, I really want to thank you for doing that. And um, I, I appreciate that, Roger. You know, I mean, uh, again, looking through the thread here, somebody mentions Jim Brown. Don't remember ever hearing about this in school. And it wasn't mentioned in school. And that's why it was a real shock to me. I mean, I had heard about it. You know, George Takai talks about it and that sort of thing. But until you go there, you can't experience it. And you, I saw you mention in the chat about the photographer. He actually had to sneak his camera into camp disguised as a lunchbox, and his family rebuilt a, a recreation of it. But I mean, this was really whitewashed. I mean, we took 110,000 Japanese uh, you know, people, most of them citizens, threw them in the prison camps, and then just never spoke about it. You know, when I, I, you know, I was born in 52. So all the time I was in high school and you hear about, you know, the dastardly things the Japanese did, bombing Pearl Harbor and, you know, the Banzai, uh, the Bataan Death March, you hear all that stuff, but you don't hear the other side. I just felt I had to say something about it. And we're coming up on 80 years of it, you know, Pearl Harbor is 80 years ago next week, right? Yeah. You know, uh, it, 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 I just, it, I, I felt I had to say something. I mean, most of my talks are the happy things about, you know, Pepsi cups at World's Fairs and that, but uh, I, you know, had a little bit of an audience to go on a soapbox today and I appreciate your in, indulging me. So I see we had some other hands up. No, uh, I yeah. guess I, I put my hand up, but yeah, sure. the, the school that our children went to, which was a private school, had a whole unit in seventh grade on intolerance, tolerance, mm -hmm. intolerance. And that's where I heard about Manzanar for the first time and we learned something about it. So it, it may not be in the public schools, but, but I have to applaud the Air Canyon for having that unit. Because we also went to the Holocaust Museum and other things as part of that unit. Um, 
it taught a lot. It really did. And I was going to say, you mentioned the the uh, um, um, windshield that got got ruined. You didn't mention how we had a flat tire halfway up Mount Whitney. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we were determined to have a really nice, uh, you know, vacation going out of town. So we, we drove up there and uh, uh, we wanted to go up to Mount Whitney and uh, driving along came around uh, a bend and there was a large rock in the road. So I had the choice, do I hit the large rock or do I drive off the cliff? So I, I opted for rock, which ended up with a flat tire in the, on the side of this road. And uh, amazingly, the uh, cell service worked. Amazingly, the, uh, I mean, again, Manzanar and Lone Pine are in the middle of nowhere. But I call, help me. I mean, no, we were in an angle. I was not looking forward to the idea of putting the car up in a jack and putting the donut tire on it on, on this angle. <clears throat> Auto Club answered. Guy came up the hill an hour later, took us down, and super friendly people. I mean, they could have gouged me nine ways to Sunday because I needed a tire. No, I don't have the right one, but this is kind of good. Or, you know, if I had an old one, I'd give it to you and everything. And, uh, you know, so, uh, yeah, it was, it was a trip not to be forgotten. That's another reason I did not take a cotter car on this, on this trip. So, so uh, I'm just going through the chats here. David English asked about a uh, photo showing both the US military guard and the internal Japanese line. No, the Japanese uh, soldiers were not given uh, arms. Uh, they, they basically had to be an honor guard type police, knowing that if anybody did anything really bad, the uh, American military police could come in. But they did not want any arms under control of uh, the Japanese inside the camp, both for the thought that they might uh, use them to get out, but also for the fact that they, uh, you know, could use them against each other. And uh, so that was not done. Uh, I see some other hands up. So as I'm reading through the chat, Janet Howard. Yes. Hi. Um, about six years ago, the Skirball had a really good exhibit on Ansel Adams photography at Manzanar. I was wondering if anybody else had seen it. I guess not. Anyhow, I don't know if it's ever going to be someplace again, but it was very well worth it. It's totally sanitized, but the docents that did the tours told that were um, actually in the camps and that they did a really good job. And the other thing is, I just like to give a shout out to my father who's long gone, but he went to Roosevelt High School in Los Angeles, which was a third Mexican American, a third Jewish American, and a third Japanese American. And he was born in 1920. So when the war broke out, he would have been 21. And um, he ran into some of his friends from high school and they told him that they were going to the racetrack and then um, they would not be coming home. And so he made it his mission to make sure that my brother and I knew exactly what had happened. Because when I went to school, it was not taught. It is part of the curriculum now and all kids learn about it, but it was completely disappeared from the curriculum. And the third one thing I want to say, there is a play that I saw at the Pasadena Playhouse. I was just trying to find the name. I don't know if anybody saw that. It's a one man show uh, about a, a real person who had been interned. He, he was from Washington, I think. Does anybody? Remember who that was? Anyhow, that's another one that if it ever comes back, I always see these things like the last day. And so um, he does all of the characters himself. It was one of the most powerful things I ever saw. And I'm gonna Google it and put it in the chat because hopefully it will come back. He was amazing and it was just so poignant. That's it. Great, thank you. And Again, you know, uh, schools today may be teaching it, but I can safely say the Baldwin Junior and Senior High School on Long Island did not even mention it when I grew up. Not mine yeah. either. It's yeah. very spotty where they teach it. And so in, in diverse areas like California and, and maybe, you know, New York and stuff, they'd be teaching it, but they're not teaching it. It's not across the country. So, um, but there are a ton of resources out there that people can look up online. There's museums now, the Japanese American National Museum in downtown LA and Little Tokyo is an excellent place to go to learn about this too. So um, there, there are resources out there if you're interested or if you want to send someone else, you know, and have them uh, learn about it, so. Great, thanks. Brock? Uh, yeah, the, one thing I do want to correct you on, um, the mountains behind you in your picture and when you look at Jim Brown's picture, the, the gray mountains behind the brown mountains, those are the high Sierra or the Sierra mountains. The uh, Alabama hills are the brown ones you see behind Jim's, in Jim's picture there. 
they're around the Lone Pine area. They don't stretch all the way to Manzanar. So just for future, if you get this talk again, talk about those as the Sierras and, and uh, the other ones are the, the Alabama Hills in the foreground. But you're right, there was a lot of films made there more recently, uh, and besides Westerns, uh, what was kind of interesting to us, the first time we went and saw the first Iron Man movie, we were still living in the Sierras, and that scene where he's showing off his new rockets to the guys that they want to buy them, they blow up the Alabama Hills. <laughs> so we made a big joke in the fact, well, we can't go see the Alabama Hills anymore, they just blew them up. But of course, it was all done in CGI, but that's just a little side note there. Relative to Manzanar, yes, it's a very interesting site. I've been to it a few times, especially since I was going up and down the highway there all the time. Um, but the, uh, uh, and, and I wasn't aware of it through school as none of us were because of, of, you know, they weren't teaching it. I only became aware of it the first time I went up to the Sierras on a fishing trip with my family. We drove by it. It wasn't, of course, it was, it was noted as to what it was, but you, I don't think you could even do a self-guided tour at that time. Then they opened it up to kind of a self-guided tour through it. And then they did the remodeling where they changed the, uh, or took the gymnasium and reestablished it for the, the, the museum, which was really kind of nice. Um, and really gives you a lot of the story there that went on. I thought they did a very excellent job of that. And that film that's in there, if you didn't get a chance to see that, that's an excellent film. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I, we drove by it and I said, what was with that thing? And my dad said, who was in World War II, told me what it was all about. And it was like, well, that's interesting. How come, I've never heard of that before. And he says, no, they don't really talk about it much. And so anyway, uh, but I thought your presentation was very, very well done. And even some of the stuff you talked about, I hadn't been aware of. I know I was the first time I went through it, very impressed with all those rock and flower gardens um from the standpoint of uh, the the ponds and pools because the fact that as horrible as that place was and as horrible as the conditions were that they had to live in they were able to make something out of it that would at least give them a little more of uh some sanity in their life uh, at least a place to reflect or to get you know kind of get away from the harshness of what that was in some little way and it was very to me very impressive that so many people would just have gone through it and trudged through it and yet they tried to make the best they could of a bad situation which you know as you said shouldn't have happened it was you know just a lot of fear mongering that went on at that time nobody knew they were uh you know one of the more even though they had been immigrating to the united states for many many years they for whatever reasons they, you know, people didn't know them, and and uh, the fear was, oh, they're fiercely loyal loyal to the emperor, and therefore they'll turn on all the Americans. And the interesting thing was, there wasn't a single Japanese American that did any spying. Of course, they were tied up in camps for, but not the entire time. But there was no incident of any Japanese American doing any spying for the Japanese government in the United States, and yet. The Germans, who largely were left alone, other than the ones you mentioned that you know they knew had very, very strong ties to Hitler's movement and all that sort of thing, and were very outspoken about it, uh, there were, a lot, relatively speaking, a lot of German spies, German Americans, who became spies for the Nazis in the United States. But we didn't lock all of them up, so it was just kind of interesting that just you know ir irrational fear led to this situation. The only good thing about it is, and I'm glad they've made this monument, like I say, hopefully we never repeat this mistake. Yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, it's, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's numbing when you get out there, like, you know, when Carol and I went out there the first time, we were the, basically the only people on the property because it was late at night. And you just stand there and you look, you know, it's a mile this way, a mile that way. And you think 10,000 people, you know, wow. Thanks, Brock. Brent? Yes, a couple of points. One is there is a memorial, a monument in downtown DC to the Japanese internment. It's uh, fairly close to Union Station in the direction of the mall and all the other monuments. So easy to get to if you're in town. Uh, part of it is a statue. It has birds, the cranes, which are very 
symbolic for the Japanese, with barbed wire. Uh, there are some inscriptions on it. Uh, there's at least one from Ronald Reagan saying about how bad it was. So that's something that you can see in D.C. if you're in town. A second comment. Let me just bond you with one, one second. Let me just go back to something real quick because I did forget to do one thing and you just kind of made me think of it. Hang on just one second okay. here. I want to just go back to the pictures here. Yeah, I meant to get back to this timeline. I had meant to st stick it into the uh, uh, the shot. Hang on, let's need to fix something here. I had meant to uh, throw this uh, slide back at the end of the uh, the talk as well. So let me just jump up here. Where did I hide it? Okay, share a screen. Share this real quick. Timeline uh, again on this particular thing. Uh, and I'll get back in just a second, Brent. So in as the time went on, they realized, oh, we don't need to keep all these people locked up. So they they put uh, Executive Order 9066 in abeyance. It was still on the books, but we're not going to enforce it. So we're going to let you back out of camp. And as I mentioned, then we're going to throw you out of camp. Okay, so that happened 1945. Send everybody home. Manzanar, not talk, not discuss, whatever. Well, finally, still on the books. That on by law, the United States could have taken any Japanese person and put them back in the Manzanar. And so Gerald Ford rescinded it officially February 19th, 1976. This is the beginning of when they started uh, acknowledging what they had done. And, uh, you know, where the people, the uh, basically the children that had grown up there or children of the people that had grown up there started saying, hey, this is wrong. This is not right at all. So they went off in uh, 1988, they passed a new act saying that we're never ever gonna do this again. 1989, they decided we're gonna make uh, appropriations to uh, uh, make reparations to people. Uh, when you came out of Manzanar, they gave you basically a bus ride back to where you came from and a very small amount of money. I don't recall the amount of money, but it was something like $50. You have to rebuild your life with $50 now. Wow. Uh, they later did reparations and they gave them $20,000 for people that had been out there. That's $20,000 in 1980 something money. Uh, you know, again, whatever money you lost in 1941 was peanuts. And, the, you know, their lives were ruined for a lot of these people. I mean, really uh, upset. But, uh, and then in 1993, Bill Clinton did a formal apology on behalf of the United States government. And then the Park Service, as I mentioned, took over the, the facility. So uh, I just did want to mention that the U.S. government finally has acknowledged it and done things like you said, meant, built that memorial. So I'm sorry, I just wanted to bring that up when you reminded me. Go ahead. Okay, another interesting point. Uh, there were some of the Nisei, that is the Japanese Americans, who served in World War II in the Pacific. I remember reading an account by one of them and he was in some military camp in the Pacific, and as he's walking along, a white guy walks past, picks up his hat, and that is the Nisei's hat, and then puts it back on and just walks on. And so this guy asks, what was that about? And his companion explains that in the South Pacific, uh, in the war, big problem with lice. The Imperial Japanese forces solve it just by everybody shaving their head, uh, shaving off all their hair, whereas in the American service, we solve it by using insecticides. So if it's a Japanese looking guy and he has a full head of hair, he must be American. Yeah, it's so. interesting. They did let them serve in the uh, Pacific theater, but I don't think in a combat role. For the most part, I think they were in military intelligence and they were invaluable in trying to decipher the uh, um, uh, you know, radio transmissions. And as they took over bases, the paper and that, I don't think they put them into hand to hand ground combat uh, because the reason is, as you mentioned, some guys just as likely to shoot them, you know, not sure who they are. But that's interesting about the, the hair and the, the, the hat. Yeah, this guy was not talking about uh, being part of, you know, combat. Like in Europe, there was a, a whole battalion called the Go for Broke Battalion. But he, w he was there and, and he was Japanese-American. And at one point he says, 
uh, he and one of his Nisei friends were a little ways away from the base and a white American soldier approached him and said, are you guys Chinese? And not thinking, he said, no, we're Japs, and was marched back to the camp. And, uh, you know, after they explained it all, it was okay. But uh, you, you can understand uh, why it would have been difficult for them to be in combat and uh, easily to be mistaken for enemy soldiers. Yep. Great. Thanks. Don? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm assuming that, I'm, I'm hoping the answers are right, that there, there was no attempt to justify what we did out there on that site, that they, they didn't try to say, well, we did this for a good reason. Uh, that we're, they, the, the site, they, pardon me? They did in 1942. They were saying, you saw in the movie, yeah. we had to do it. In later years, no, they, they basically said there was no, they, they came and pretty much said it was wrong. It totally violated the Constitution. What they had done was in the 1920s, they had started a, a thing realizing that Japan was getting more and more militaristic. They had started mm -hmm. a system of classifying Japanese uh, under suspicion and called an ABC system. The, uh, the ones that uh, you know, were the absolute uh, rabid, you know, he's going to you know, die for the emperor. The ones that uh, might be of interest and the others, ah, we just need to know where they live just in case. So they, they had been looking at just like they had the same thing with the Germans. You had the guys that were members of the Nazi Bund marching around their brown searches, uh, shirts and Joliet, stuff like that. Uh, so they had the ABC system. Well, Pearl Harbor kind of took them by surprise. So rather than just picking up all the A group, which they had originally planned, because one of the guys in the C group, and we didn't know he's really in the A group, they just picked up everybody. Well, they later came back and said, that was absolutely totally wrong. There was no justification for what we did. And that's part of Clinton's apology. Well, that's the reason I was asking is that, of course, it was absolutely unforgivable. I, I realized that we tried to justify it back then. Uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that we weren't trying to justify it now because there is no justification. The reason I bring that up actually is about a year ago, I got in a conversation group with someone who had some other phobias and he was just a, he was trying to say we should take all people ex religious groups until we know they're safe and put them someplace. And my response was, how can you even say that? He said, well, we did it with the Japanese and that worked out. And I nearly came. I said, you know, that is a mark of shame on the country. But that's why I'm so grateful you did something like this, because people don't understand. There's still people. I wasn't taught about this in grade school. They do. They do teach that where I went to school now. But there are people who don't know and people who know just enough to try to use it for their to justify their extremist views. And it's it's terrifying what we did. I, you know, hopefully we will never do it again. But I, I'm very grateful for you getting the word out there. I've never seen a presentation on it until now. I'm, I'm very thankful for you showing this. Yeah, I've heard a lot of the, well, we did it once. We can do it again. You know, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. people are commenting in the comments there about Dachau, another place I've been that's just horrific. You know, you, you don't want to. Just because you made a mistake once doesn't mean you can make it again. Yeah. Uh, Roger, I'd like to hear the story you mentioned in the chat. We have just one other person at his hand up. Greg, I, I see you posted something about a chat with Willie Ito, a mutual friend of ours. Yeah, actually, there is a Disney connection because Willie Ito worked for Disney for a long time. He also worked for Hanna-Barbera for a long time. Willie Ito was in an internment camp and has done many interviews talking about it. Um, and also uh, Iwo Takamoto, who worked for Disney uh, in the late 50s. And um, if you look at Princess Aurora or, um, and I believe even uh, Anita, especially when she falls into the pond in the beginning of 101 Dalmatian, she looks a lot like Daphne. I think the, the look of the Hanna-Barbera uh, female is Iwo's. He designed the Scooby-Doo characters. Almost, he was the creative director for years. Um, Iwo wrote a book and uh, he describes, just like uh, George Takei did, describes in detail uh, what it was like to be living in those camps. So there are, um, like a lot of you, nothing in, in public school about this uh, when I was growing up. I first learned about this from a, from a TV movie mm -hmm. starring Nobu McCarthy, who um, was in Karate Kid. She was in a lot of movies, but she was she got a kind of a lead role in this. The most memorable role was when she finally broke down and started breaking all of her dishes. Yeah. 
yeah. outside of her house. That was that was a very memorable scene. Um, it was called Farewell to Manzanar. And it's the kind of thing that should be available everywhere. And I just looked it up and it is nowhere. It's not even on YouTube, but it was one of those two hour TV movies. The first segment of it is on Manzanar uh, on YouTube where she breaks the, uh, uh, the dishes. The movie now, the rights belong to the Japanese American Museum, if I get in the name right, in uh, LA. Their gift shop is currently closed, but they do sell it via mail order. So- uh, Oh, they do. Yeah, it's, uh, I think, 1995 uh, DVD. But uh, yeah, it was a made-for-TV movie, I think, on NBC about 84 or so. And uh, they've signed the rights to the museum as a, a fundraiser. And uh, if you have a moment, go to YouTube, uh, search uh, Farewell to Manzanar, and watch that dish-breaking sequence. And it is just heart-wrenching. Power powerful, powerful cinema. Yeah, it is, it is a, a thing that uh, we need. To, it's, it's the same thing that they say about if you don't know history, it repeats itself. And, you know, you mentioned it can happen again. Well, it kind of happened a few years ago. And, you know, I, I, politics and religion creep into all these conversations, but we're all human beings and we all have backgrounds. You know, um, I'm Catholic and I didn't find out until I was an adult listening to talk radio. And I listened to back when there was neutral talk radio um, and they had both opinions on, on an AM station. I was stunned to find out when I was in my 20s that people hated Catholics because I thought, well, you know, we just, you know, who, who knew that? And, and then I found out from a Disney fan group that a, uh, a woman said, well, my father taught me that if I ever walked into a Catholic church, it, the building would collapse and I would die. So, you know, I, I, I was stunned to find that out because I was not raised to, 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 to know people hated different groups. I mean, you knew, we knew about slavery. We always knew about slavery and we knew about prejudice, but it's especially difficult. And what was heinous about the the Asian thing. And there was also Chinese uh, things happening in California too, with the railroads and stuff is when it's, especially when it's an appearance thing where people, uh, when, it's a, when it's a face, when it's a color, um, you know, you don't always know if somebody, German Americans, you know, they didn't do this because not everybody knew who was German American. The Nazis put labels on Jewish people so they would know, which was, which was incredibly horrible. So when it's, it's truly when it's based on appearance, um, then it's even worse. So people are capable of terrible things. And this sort of thing, especially um, when you kind of know the know people and you hear it through their eyes. Um, George K. wrote beautifully about it. His book, I would highly recommend. Um, he describes the curtains and the walls and, and every, every inch of it. Uh, it is an astonishing thing. And, and I agree with everyone, Bill. This is, this is a, a I, didn't, I didn't know you could tour the places. And in a way, it's kind of, even though there were, there were no, you know, efficient mass killings like there were in those places, that was, those were people who were insane doing that to people. We were supposedly the same people. And the fact that those places were there and you could look at them, it's sort of as important to see them to know that Americans did this to Americans. Yeah, if it wasn't so far off the beaten track, it'd be a great place to take school groups. You know, it, it's interesting, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm Catholic as well. And, and the same sort of thing you mentioned, you know, you don't realize people have prejudices against different groups. Uh, I, being of mostly Irish uh, background, I, I did know that back in the New York, you know, there were uh, signs about no Irish need to apply for, for work or whatever, but I was in, college and I was going with a, a, a gal on Long Island and her father came to me one day and said, this is the last day you will ever see my daughter. And I said, well, what did I do? You know, I thought I was treating it pretty nice. And he goes, she's Jewish and you're a Catholic and uh, you're getting too close and there's no way my daughter is ever going to uh, marry a Catholic. So you're barred from the house forever. And that was the first time I ever felt any personal uh, uh, prosecution or persecution like that. But it was really just, you know, he, what, what I remembered about that day in particular was he needed his car stereo fixed he, or car radio. He had a short in it. And I got down onto the uh, dashboard and I fixed his car and I was good enough to fix his car, but now I wasn't good enough to you know, take his daughter to the movie anymore. That was just, oh, wow. So I got back at him. I married Carol. She's Jewish. Luckily, her parents. <laughs> <laughs>
but uh, no, I mean, yeah, I, I you always try to take people as people and not as groups or, or you know, whatever. So uh, Dave, we'll get to you in a second. And I, th I think uh, Roger and Yuko had their hand up at first. Oh, Kevin, we'll get to you. But Roger, did you want to talk about your grandfather? Um, if people want to hear, um, uh, you did an uh, excellent. Are you breaking up a bit, Roger? Earlier about talking about the assembly centers first. Oh, uh, yeah. I hope it, is that okay now? Why don't you go to someone else? Okay, you're maybe just a little far from the microphone. We'll come back to you. So, Dave? Well, I don't have any particular words of wisdom here other than um, it's important to, to learn things. Your talk today was excellent. I've driven by that camp many, 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 many times on the way to, to Tuolumne Meadows and Yosemite. And uh, I've never stopped, but based on your talk today, I'm going to make a point of... Uh, allowing some time to see that place uh, firsthand. I did think it's interesting uh, in the background of um, Jim Brown, there's a great shot and there's true in your pictures too of uh, the top of Mount Whitney and the road that you talked about that allows you to drive up to the portals at 8,000 feet is um, is a great trip, even if you're not going to spend time there just to to drive up that road. But you know, watch out for rocks that might jump in front of you. That's for sure. I think it's the, the takeaway from this is um, you know here now 80 years have passed, and we have a, a perspective that's based on a lot of more information than was available at the time. And I find myself today um, talking to, to my children who. Many of them have not moved, have not worked outside of the Los Angeles area or traveled. So one thing I try to share with them is the rest of the world is not like here. And you can fill in the block, whether it's Yosemite or New York or the South. The rest of the world is not all like here, number one. Number two, don't believe everything you hear about technology or social situations from the Internet or without researching it yourself, because there's much information to know and there's a lot of misinformation that's out there. All presented perfectly, it looks to be true, but when you start, if you're really interested, then it's important to validate those thoughts for yourself if you're gonna, if you're gonna base some action on it. Because we do live in a, a country that's relatively free we have a tremendous, with the, with the internet, it's not like we got to look something up in the Encyclopedia Britannica as when I was growing up that, you know, if you didn't have the latest volume, you didn't have the, the latest information. And so it is important to, as much as there's some terrible things in history, erasing them or saying it didn't happen is not, it's not beneficial. It's only by researching it and finding out what really happened and the circumstances of the time and has, having served in the military in the Vietnam era and going there and seeing what we were told when we were there, both by the, the, the military press, as well as what was being told in the United States, it wasn't even close to what was happening. So it's only with the passage of time that people will talk about it and eventually you can maybe not understand it because this this whole thing seems just I can't believe that as a society we allowed it to happen but knowing firsthand what went on during the Vietnam era I can see where hysteria you know here were these people that looked different and we were told that, that I mean Pearl Harbor when I wasn't alive then but when you listen to the radio recollection, you know, the president of the United States saying a day in infamy and you watch the movies. And if you can imagine all of a sudden airplanes flying over Los Angeles and bombing and killing people, I mean, we can't, I can't, but nonetheless, uh, it would be easy to accept that perhaps we should be taking some kind of action. And closest thing I have is 9-11 and, and, the, and the terrible, terrible thing that happened. And 
I don't think enough time has passed yet to see if we took the right approach because it takes, seems like it takes us five or 10 or 20 years to either declassify or to really, really, really determine what happened at the time and what we could have done better. Because yeah. we, we did what we did, but was that the right thing? It's now with time passing, it seems like terrible. Manzanar is a terrible part of our history, but we need to learn from it. It'd be bad enough if they had said, okay, you know, we got to protect the port and the railroads and everything. Let's go grab the uh, A gr group and bring those in and, you know, put them in a camp and, you know, after through two, three months, sort it out. But let's go grab everybody, including the four-year-olds and the or kids in an orphanage. I mean, <laughs> I, I have a hard time believing that the kids in the orphanage represented any threat in any form, shape, or fashion in the United States, and we sent them to prison camp. You know, that, that's yeah. The, the only the only thing that you, I mean, again, we're we're bordering on the uh, the political and um, um, religious aspect of this, but the the whole, you can't separate the children from the parents. And so what about the, the people that are, they're coming in on, coming through our border illegally. And, and you know, one side of me says, I'm an American, it's a border, it needs to be defended. And the other side says, here's the land of opportunity. Here's these poor people that need a job. They're coming here as a family. How you can't separate the children from the parents. It's a problem. I don't know what the right answer is. No. Other than you need to to call what call it what it is, it's a problem. Yeah. And war and and war is a hellish thing. There's no nothing nice about it. There's having having served in the military, there is just nothing nice. Everything about it, the way you treat people, um, it, it's bad. And it's been around forever, and it's likely to be around forever. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Kevin, you had your hand up? Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, those who don't know me, I'm Bill's younger brother, Kevin. I live in Georgia these days. When Bill suggested we take this drive on vacation, I was a bit wary. I'm very glad we made the drive uh, to see the, the ugly history of man against the beauty of nature, juxtaposition like that was really quite striking. But I want to give a special men mention to the National Park Service and the great job they do at the camp. They tell the history, they tell the human stories involved in it. They don't try to whitewash anything. It's a very truthful presentation. And I think the, the uh, Park Service deserve a lot of recognition for what they do out there. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, I was really glad. I, I thought Kevin, like I, a uh, history buff, I'm living where he does. He certainly knows a lot about the Civil War and you know the uh, odds and ends of that. But we've always had discussions over the years about you know, different different parts of history. And uh, Kevin's actually a tour guide down in Georgia. If you're in Savannah, I'll, I'll tell you how to find him and he can give you a great tour. But knowing he was coming out here for the week, I thought he would uh, like to, to see it. Uh, like I said, the hills are nice. We had a really good time up there wandering around too. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, thanks, Kevin. Uh, Yuko and Dennis, you were just up there a week ago? We were there Sunday. Uh, this week. Uh, we go often up 395 because our daughter, uh, daughter's family lives in Reno. So we do 395 to Reno. And so that's why we were there, or actually, we've been there. We were actually passing it on Sunday and also on the way there, passed it last Tuesday. Um, but uh, we didn't go into the museum, but we have been in the museum in the past. Yeah, well, I was there Saturday. I would have been there. Right, you were there the day before. Yeah. <laughs> also, yeah. for, for people uh, from other locations, and you're talking about Mount uh, Whitney, uh, as the highest point in the 48 lower states, not right next to Death Valley, the lowest point in the United States for other people who are listening. Nothing yeah. to do with this topic. This topic is beyond that, but... Well, again, I try to encourage people to go up there, you know, and I, I appreciate, you know, Brock, uh, you know, giving me the pointers about the hills. Yeah, I mean, the Alabama hills are the, the lower ones, but the, if you go up to the, the Sierras, <clears throat> it's not very far past Manzanar. You get into some beautiful scenery. I mean, Carol and I were up there in fall, 
I forget how many years ago, three, four years ago, and the leaves were turning colors. It was just absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. And, uh, you know, I'd, I want to go back uh, and, and go do it again. So it's, it's a great area to, to visit. Thanks, Hello. Roger. Try again. <laughs> Excuse me. Try again. You there, Roger? You can't hear me. Yeah, I, I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, that's good. Um, and my, my Zoom, once in a while, my connection goes whack over computer, so sorry if it seems bad. But, um, so what I was saying is that you, you did a, a great job touching on the, uh, on the uh, assembly centers, like the racetracks at uh, Tafaran and Santa Anita and the various um, county, county fairgrounds and stuff that they used to assemble people, and then they sent them to these 11 internment camps. But there's another whole layer that even people that know about the camps don't know existed. And my grandfather was caught up in a completely different uh, action by the US government in the Department of Justice. So even before Roosevelt's executive order came out, like you had mentioned, the FBI was already keeping tabs of people in the Japanese American community. And my grandfather being a Buddhist minister, and also he taught Japanese language school to the children of the temple, he was on the list. So before they were ordered to go to the internment camps, he got a visit and was arrested out of their house and um, taken away prior to th that all happening. And he was sent to Tuna Canyon Detention Center. And if you guys in LA know Tuna Canyon, they're, they're actually currently trying to get a memorial and all that uh, recognition up there, but it was a detention center built up in the hills there. And it was called Tuna Canyon Detention Center. So he was separated from my mom's family. And then from there, he was sent to another Department of Justice um, incarceration camp in Crystal City. And um, he was actually for the first two years of the war deemed too dangerous to be with the regular people that got to be so lucky to be in these internment camps like Manzanar. And he was put in a special detention center. And then um, finally, when they, things calmed down, my mom and grandmother were able to go live with him in this special camp. So um, there's, th there's a whole lot of other injustices that went on even beyond this really broad base story that you described. So I, I just want if anybody's interested, look up Tuna Canyon Detention Center. They have a website and they have several people that are trying to make sure that doesn't get forgotten and could get a memorial up there and all that too. So just wanted to share that. So Gosh, I've, I've driven by there. I live a few miles from it. So thanks for telling me about it. Yeah, I'm, all, I'm uh, from here to Tuna Canyon. I could be there by 1230. So yeah, it's real, real wow. close. Thanks, Roger. I'll have to look more into that. Yeah, my mom, before they got put into camp, my mom and my grandma went up to the Tuna Canyon and they were able to stick their hand through the chain link fence and, and see my grandfather. But, um, you know, and, and what was also interesting and that people don't know that happened in World War II, that Japanese, people of Japanese descent um, in South, South America, like Peru and Brazil, were also rounded up by the U.S. government and brought into the camps up here in the U.S. So not only were they just taking the American citizens, but they were going in and what do you call it, extraditing people from other countries and bringing them in too, which I think is really, you know, it's just beyond words what, what was being done. Yeah, they were basically going around the world arresting people for being Japanese. And then when they let them out of the camps, they weren't able to go back to some of the places like Peru that said, hey, we don't want you, you know, so now they became people without a country. It turned into a real mess. Right. And this was all done under the guise of protecting the Japanese, right? It's for yeah. your protection. Yeah. And um, that, that lasted for many years. And, and, you know, I'm glad that, you know, history has been righted and, and people now, re, you know, recognize it for what it was. But, you know, one other piece I didn't mention was in the movie, they kept talking about uh, so many of these were American citizens and that others were aliens. Well, they neglected to point out that a lot of the people who had uh, come here from Japan we're not able to become our American citizens because of quotas we had on immigration. And it wasn't until 1952 that they lifted on that a lot of these people are allowed to uh, become American citizens. So a lot of them have been trying to become American citizens for years and years and years, and we're just not uh, you know, allowed to do so. 
uh, and again, 1952, they uh, you know they decided to uh, you know to, to write that wrong. So calling them aliens, uh, they may have been born in Japan, but a lot of the people, I mean, some of these people are talking about. I was born in Japan. I was brought over here at three months old. You know, I mean, you couldn't have been more American than me, but they weren't an American citizen because we wouldn't let them be. Dave, they were classified as enemy aliens too. The, the complete term. They weren't just aliens. Right? They're enemy aliens. So that's how the government referred to them. Right. I just wanted to to thank you again for a great presentation. Um, I, I really miss these. And even though I can look at them on Zoom, it's not near as fun or as informative as sitting through the Q&A. And um, I always learn something. Today was no exception. The pictures were amazing. The talk was wonderful. Uh, it provides a, a needed perspective. I will never drive by Manzanar again without having these other thoughts in my mind. So. Thanks for doing this, Bill. I know it's not trivial to prepare each week. And even though I don't attend, I do I do look at it and say, oh gosh, too bad I've got can't be here. And then I've signed up to do it on uh, on Zoom. But doing it live is the is the best. So thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for the kind words. Hey, yesterday I, I had a uh, you know, I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the call, a heck of a day. And I, 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 I had been intending to, you know, uh, I like everything else. I, I put everything off to the end all the time. And I'll just get home from my patrol and I'll, I'll put this together. And I got home yesterday. I was just wiped. I was standing in the middle of Reseda Boulevard for four straight hours watching people clean up blood around me. It was a hell of a oh day. My, oh but I got gosh. home. I said, I got to put this together. Because I, I said to Carol, when I got home, I said, I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. And maybe I'll have to postpone it. But it, because knowing Pearl Harbor anniversary was next week, I just felt I had it, you know, put it together. So thanks. Carol, you had your hand up? Yeah, I just, all this talk of Manzanar as, as though it's the only camp like that. Now I'm curious about the other camps because I don't know anything about the others and I don't know what information exists on those, but there's probably great stories, well, terrible stories uh, to be told about the others as well. Yeah, when you and I were up, we took our drive when we went up uh, north, we drove uh, by Thule Lake where one of the camps was and we didn't go in because we were running short on time. But if you missed, if you were a malcontent or a troublemaker at Manzanar, they sent you to Thule Lake. So if you looked at the pictures today of, of Manzanar and saw what a, a hellhole it was, you can imagine Thule Lake. Tule Lake was more up in the mountains, so it was a colder camp than, uh, uh, than Manzanar was more of a hotter camp. But there were 11 of these camps. Uh, I think Topaz, Arizona had one. There were a number of them around. They were on that chart I had at, at, at the beginning. Uh, and uh, they had about 11,000 people at Manzanar, 120,000 in total uh, scattered across all the camps. So. Uh, I don't know. I, I know Tule Lake does have uh, something that's, you know, a visitor center that's there. I don't know if all the other camps have the same amount of, uh, you know, museum presence or whatever. Uh, and I, I doubt if I'll ever make it to all the other camps. I'm sure some of them have been pretty much scrubbed out. I mean, if you go to Santa Anita Racetrack today, <laughs> they're not going to mention that they were a concentration camp. You know, I mean, it's, it's just been scrubbed and, and gone. So, uh, but no, I do appreciate uh, people, uh, what you go, oh, yeah. Dave, are you saying Bill doesn't pay you to be here? Tom, Tom, that's our secret. Now everybody else gets a check. No, <laughs> quiet. No, I, I do appreciate people joining, particularly on a non-happy, you know, Mickey Mouse or World's Fair type topic, but I, I thought it was an important one and uh, being timely for this, this point in time. Again, if you're anywhere up in LA, really suggest you drive up that way. There's uh, some good hotels right in, uh, uh, Lone Pine, some good hotels in Independence, a really nice bakery up there uh, and, and stuff like that. So go up to the Sierras, uh, but plan on spending the better part of a day at Manzanar. Um, you know, the museum can take you quite a while to go through a tremendous amount of displays, but you can take the driving path and then you can just park your car and you can walk all throughout that multi square mile property. You can drive up to the reservoir. You can uh, it's, it's, it's a very large area. And then uh, go on and drive movie lane road, but do not try to make the entire circle of it because uh, 
Kevin and I, we got to the first part where the thing was gone and it was obviously wiped, you know, wiped out and said, oh God. And the GPS is just telling us, make a left turn. Make a left. So we found another road and we got there and there was this ravine going down at this incredible angle, sort of a muddy sort of thing down below. And, I, and Kevin's saying, I think we can make it. So I walked down the ravine, came up the other side and I said, you know, I have no guarantee that when I get up to this other side, if I get up to the other side, that this road actually goes anywhere either because we had the California aqueduct between us and Route 395. So I said, we'll go back this other way and we found another way around it. But we were standing and looking down at this thing and I, all I was thinking was, how would I ever explain this to Enterprise run a car? <laughs> <laughs> and Kevin's he like, well, we could go for it. I go, you feel like pushing, Brock? <laughs> yeah, I actually, I did want to make one other comment to you just so you know. Um, the wind blowing up there in the sandstorm, you probably were up there in the spring. My guess is April, May, somewhere in that range, maybe as early as March. That's when those kind of storms happen and they can be pretty bad. I've witnessed some incredible ones when you went by the uh, Owens Dry Lake there. There was one time a, a storm, a winds were coming down the hills and within probably 200 yards of the highway when it got out into the basin of the, that old lake, this was before they started all the reclamation stuff they're doing now. There was a dust cloud so high and so solid, you couldn't see anything beyond it. And it was quite amazing. But the rest of the time, it's a pretty benign area. Now, Manzanar, yes, still had all the dust because as you saw in the pictures, there was nothing growing around it. So even a slight little afternoon breeze brought up dust. People were just walking around in it pulled up all the dust onto themselves and they walk into their little house, you know, and it sloughs off. So it was just a dusty place to live. But, you know, it, it's not like, cause I, I, I commuted that for four years while I was still working for Disney and we had our bed and breakfast up there uh, in the Sierras. I was commuting that weekly and I ran into two dust storms in those four years because they don't happen that often. You just were unlucky that time, but I just, Wanted to say that so people realize you don't have to take a rental car up there. You can take your own car. And the times to watch out for is the spring. That's when you get the, the, the temperature variations that occur that create those wind coming down off the Sierras because of the heat you know, transfer. So you know how that whole thing works. Yeah, you're dead right. It was spring. We had decided to go to uh, Death Valley and see that uh, obviously we're not going to go to Death Valley in summer. So we gone out there in the spring, and uh, it, it was it was definitely spring. We made the cross from Death Valley over back over towards Lone Pine, got the Lone Pine, and it was, well, that was fun because you drive up to it, and oh, this can't be too bad. And then you get into it, and you realize, okay, do I turn around, and go back, or am I just near the end of it? Oh, I'll go a little further. And then I remember, it looked sort of like rain. We didn't know if it was rain or or dust, and it turned out to be dust. Yeah. So. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, again, I, I knew we were going to be driving on some of the, the dirt roads and everything. So I, I just got, because I would not, for example, take my car out to the reservoir. Uh, you know, oh, yeah. 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 You know, I mean, there's just stuff like that. I mean, you know, particularly my car, as Carol knows, I, I've blown several tires just on the potholes of the LA freeways. I have a low profile BMW, and it's just the tires are about that wide. So uh, I, I just said, I, I got all these enterprise points, so I'll, I'll go take their car. But yeah, no. like, go up that area other than spring, go in fall. Fall is just low, <laughs> the trees are turning color. I mean, Carol and I are up there in, uh, uh, again, I mentioned Convict Lake a couple of times, just gorgeous. And the trees are turning color and it was just, the air was crisp. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful spot. And uh, I think this, uh, you know, this coming year, we'll, we'll go back and do it again. So I appreciate everybody joining next week. Don, real quick, do you want to fill us in on uh, what you're going to be talking about? Sure, let me, yeah, I'm unmuted. Sure, uh, next week I'm going to be talking about probably the largest World's Fair that none of you have ever heard of before. It was a Texas Centennial Exposition in 1936. It had 135 exhibitors. Uh, it had over 6 million attendees over its five-month uh, course. And the neat thing about it is almost all of it is still there. It's the largest collect collection of Art Deco buildings in, on any site in the United States. So I, I've been going out there, I made three photo trips out there, spent the last three months researching it. Uh, I think you're really gonna enjoy it. I, I, it's a rabbit hole I've been diving down for a while. It's just all these stories there. Um, 
Also, just, just so you know, there's an interesting Disney connection to the place. So Walt didn't display anything there, but there's a very interesting Disney connection to the place. And there are a lot of connections to the New York World's Fairs and the Chicago World's Fairs. So I think, I think you folks will enjoy it. Great. Well, we'll look forward to it. So we'll see you uh, all next uh, uh, Saturday, same bad time, same bad channel. And uh, uh, I get to enjoy it because I don't have to do anything for it. So it's a double win for me. <laughs> So uh, thanks all, and uh, for my fellow uh, WED uh, guys, I thought we were going to have lunch soon, but I guess now uh, with the uh, latest variant, not. So uh, maybe someday we ought to do a virtual one and just eat in front of each other on Zoom. So uh, great to see you guys again. Uh, see you back. And I uh, hope everybody has a great week in, in between. Take care. You too, Bill. Good job.